Hi there. Welcome to New Tracks Modeling. New Tracks is an exciting new digital opportunity to obtain mentoring to help you improve your modeling. You will meet talented modelers and manufacturers from all over the world who share their model building skills and artistic advice. Improve your modeling and increase the confidence in your modeling efforts. Share your building efforts with fellow modelers and have some fun doing it. The shows are live on Zoom and YouTube, so be sure to join in and ask your questions. Now here is New Tracks founder and your host, Jim Kello MMR. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We really do appreciate it. We hope you enjoy the show. We've got uh, some excellent modelers on the show for you this evening, and I think you're going to learn a lot. Uh, but we really do appreciate you taking the time to come uh, visit with us. And uh, we hope you tell your friends and hope come back very often and uh, uh, spend some time with us. If you missed the live show, uh, please tell your friends about uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel uh, because we have roughly 550 videos of our different shows uh, on the uh, YouTube channel, New Tracks Modeling. And uh, if you've missed any of them, Please, uh, please feel free to, uh, to go see them. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel because that way you'll get notices. Uh, if you ring the bell after you subscribe, at least you'll get notices of all of our future shows before they, uh, before they are shown. So with that said, I want to announce that we have a new volunteer that's joined our management team, uh, Alan Rogers. And Alan, I want to thank you so much for uh, volunteering to be a part of our team and uh, getting involved with the production of our show. As I've said many times, we have a lot of people that are involved in producing these shows, uh, all the way from just helping us uh, uh, find people that might be interested in doing certain things to, to uh, some of the, uh, the emails that we need to have dealt with, to uh, some of the, uh, the chat that we need to keep up with. Uh, to actually producing the shows as Alan is going to be helping us do. Uh, so if you have some time, if any amount of time, any interest, uh, we sure need your help. Uh, right now, we have, uh, because we're growing uh, and we're expanding into uh, some things that I think are really going to be fascinating and really interesting for you that we've never done before and frankly, nobody else is doing. Uh, and I'm not sure they've even thought about it yet. But the people that are helping us with it are excited. Uh, and I think that it's really going to be a, a successful endeavor. So we need some help doing that, as well as the existing uh, two shows that we do on tonight and Saturday afternoon with uh, Chris Blackmore. Now, the one special person that I need is I need an attorney who's willing to maybe do a little pro bono work for new tracks uh, because we run into uh, two not significant, but two issues that we just need an attorney to say yes or no for. That's basically what it amounts to. So if you're an attorney and you'd like to help us a little bit, my email is jimkello at newtracksmodeling.com. And I'd really appreciate the, uh, the help because we don't want to certainly break any laws, but we want to make sure that what we're doing is above board and, and uh, uh, everybody's happy with, uh, with, with, with what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention is I do get criticized every once in a while. Uh, and and if, you, if you name it, I've probably been told I'm doing it wrong. Well, one of the things somebody told me, he said, Jim, if you want to attract people, and particularly on YouTube, then you've got to make people at least feel like they might like you and the way that you act. Maybe people don't, don't realize that, that you're a, a fairly nice guy. Uh, if we could get the, the show back on, Ken, I'd appreciate it because the screen is black right now. Uh, so I've been told what I need to do is try to be more of an actor. Well, I don't know how to be an actor. I know how to build models. I love building models. Uh, I love traction. And I love my model railroad, and I love doing these shows. So what you see is my attempt at an acting career tonight. Whether it's successful, laughter is permitted. All right, with that said, I'd like to turn to uh, Father Ron. 
uh, uh, Walters, who is the provincial minister of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, Order of Friars Mine. Uh, and Father Ron is in Rome for the next three weeks, so he's not able to be here with us. But he sent us a video. Uh, and Ken, if you could run Father Ron's video for us, please. Oh God, as we express our creativity in, by creating in miniature the world around us, may we marvel at the beauty and genius which created the world and instilled in us a portion of your great knowledge and wisdom. Give success to the work of our hands, O God. Amen. Well, Father Ryan, thank you so very much. I really do appreciate it. I hope everyone realized that the reason I asked Father Ron to do this is uh, I believe that uh, that's where my talent uh, came from. Uh, and I'm not a super religious person. I'm not trying to convert anybody. Uh, but I think modeling is uh, uh, something that requires skills and we have them and we can learn them. Uh, but I think uh, uh, the, a prayer for our skills and for modeling is, uh, is important for our shows. And I certainly appreciate Father Ron's participation in, in providing that for us. If you're not familiar with it, I, I've talked about it previously and, and I, I really believe in this. The Walters Corporation is the only corporation that I know of in the world that is, and Ken, I don't know what's the matter with the show. It's not being shown live, but it's not being shown at least on my screen. Yeah, I'm getting it here. Okay. Uh, so if other people are getting it, that's fine. I just don't see it at all. I don't know why. I see you, Bob, but that's all I see right now. So anyway, uh, I'm not sure if anybody sees me or not. Probably better if they don't. Anyway. Uh, so Walters is coming out with their 2022 scholarship program. Uh, and, and Ken, if you could try to get the screen on me rather than Bob, I would appreciate it. Um, and in, in their current newsletter, uh, Walters has a picture of two of the kids, one in California, one in Pennsylvania, that have applied for the scholarship program. And they talk about how important this is uh, for the kids that are going uh, from high school into STEM programs. And a $2,500 uh, scholarship uh, is nothing to sneeze at, in my opinion. So I really hope uh, that, that the people that, that watch the show or hear about the shows, if you have kids, grandkids, great-grandkids uh, that might uh, be interested and, and eligible for it, they've got to be model railroaders, number one. Then uh, you can contact uh, uh, Karen Formico at uh, uh, Walters and uh, get the details about their scholarship program. And I hope you do, because I really hope that the scholarship program Walters has started, this is the second year for it, is highly successful and something that other companies will take up and do. Now, that's the only company that's doing it. There's one train club that I know about that's doing a scholarship program for high school graduates only in their area. Now, Walters is, is uh, uh, all over, but the, the clubs is only in their immediate area. And this club is the Rockville Model Railroad Society. And the person who the club member is Jim Anderson. Uh, he's running the scholarship program. And I'm hopeful that uh, uh, in, in the near future, uh, because I do understand that the program is off and running and they're getting applications and, and people participating from that school district. I hope somebody from the school district and Jim can come on our show and talk about such a program and, and how important it might be, not only for the kids going to college, uh, but the skills that kids learn as being model railroaders and, and having the ability then to use those skills uh, in their future careers. So I've asked uh, if that's possible. I hope it is. If it is, then we'll schedule it as soon as we possibly can. Because I'm hoping, again, other clubs, other organizations, the NMRA, maybe regions within the NMRA, uh, could start doing something like this. Because, again, I, I think this, uh, this could really be important for the future of model railroading and certainly for, for the future of some of model railroading uh, young people. You know that we have a show on Saturday. Chris Blackmar is doing a great job with it. 
Uh, I think that uh, uh, more and more people are starting to come to the Saturday show at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time in the afternoon. Uh, and Chris is uh, building an ice house. And uh, I, I think that uh, you're really going to learn an awful lot, and not just about building an ice, ice house, but about the thought process and, and what's involved in really trying to take a picture, uh, scale it to your scale, and then build it from scratch with no directions, just whatever makes sense to you. You try it. If it doesn't work, you throw it away and you start over. That's scratch building. So Saturday, 1 p.m., Chris Blackmar, uh, New Track Scratch Building Workshop. Uh, Anybody out there, as I said, if you can offer us a little time to help uh, run the shows and participate on our management team, we sure would appreciate it. Uh, the more the merrier. You have got no idea of the hours of the time that it takes uh, all of the people involved uh, to try to put on one of these shows for you. Uh, keep in mind, we've been doing this now two years. May the 1st will be two years we've been doing these shows twice a week, most weeks. Uh, in, in some parts of it in 2021, in addition to twice a week shows, we even did digital train shows. Uh, and I'd like to start those again, but I can't right now because we don't have the staff to do those kind of things. Uh, but other things we are going to start. So uh, uh, we'll see how those, those things go. Uh, then we've got a new series that we're starting on new tracks and it starts April the 27th. We've got a special guest joining uh, Phil Edward, who's going to be running this for us. And this is about local clubs and NMRA divisions at the local level. Division is the smallest organization besides a club that uh, is NMRA affiliated uh, at, at a local level. It's the place where I learned a lot about how to build models, made a lot of great friends, uh, saw a lot of models that I never would have been able to, uh, to see went to a lot of layouts that I never would have been invited to. Uh, and whether you're an NMRA member, I'm not trying to sell the NMRA, but I am trying to expose you to places where I know for a fact you can have them, you can find a mentor, you can find help in your modeling and, and meet some really fantastic people along the way. So our special guest is the president of the NMRA, Gordon Richardson. And uh, Gordon's a Scotsman. He's uh, from Scotland. I met him a while ago before he, before I think he even thought about running for NMRA president. Uh, he, he decided that he was going to turn his division, he was a division superintendent in Scotland. His division in Scotland was going to be the first division that was going to be totally digital. Uh, and this was, I forget how many years ago now, but a while back. And uh, uh, it, it you know, it, it really amazed me at the time. And I thought, I've got to participate in that. So I started attending his division meetings in Scotland, digitally. And I met him and some of the other people. And uh, that, that was my first introduction to him. He's an awfully nice guy. Uh, he's got a, uh, an accent. Uh, so you have to listen carefully. But he's a fantastic speaker and a great guy. And he's got a vision for the NMRA that I don't think most people have ever heard about you. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to him being here and kicking off this series with Phil. And I hope that you'll attend and I hope that you'll participate in it, regardless of whether you're an NMRA member or not. That makes no difference to me. Uh, I just know that this is a place locally that has an awful lot of potential benefits for modelers who are interested in improving their modeling and improving how they build models. So with that said, we have some build-alongs. All of our build-alongs are uh, included on our webpage. Uh, Jim Allen is our webmaster. So if you have a problem with our webpage, he is the person to contact. Uh, and while I'm not gonna go into great detail on, on each one of these, I do wanna mention a couple because you know the, the manufacturers that are participating in this, they're offering you a discount. They're offering your kit, them, their kits to you at a special discount uh, in order to get you possibly building kits you haven't built before, possibly starting to build kits again after many years, 
and hopefully learning some new techniques and using the person on our show as a crutch to make sure that if you buy their kit and want to build it, that you're going to be able to get help from the person who's building that kit on our show to make sure that you build the best possible kits you can. So that's what the book Build Alongs are all about. Now, on May 25th show, uh, we, well, we have, we have two Build Alongs tonight that you're going to see, but the new one's coming up. May 25th, Chris Kors, who owns Conowingo Models, and stuck his neck out to build a trolley uh, station called the Kello Trolley Station. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and I hope it's very successful. Why? Because it's named after me. Uh, so if nobody buys it, okay. I hope they do. I hope they build it. Now, I have told Chris, that as far as I'm concerned, because I'd like to see him, because he, he gambled on this. He didn't even tell me he was going to do this. He just did and I admire him for taking the, the, uh, the chance to do it and, and calling it, uh, naming it after me. But anybody that gets one of his kits and builds one of his kits, I want him to come on to my build segments of our shows that we do once a month and show us the kit that they built and how they may have modified the kit and what they did to different to the kit. And if they do that, then not only will they get to show it on our show and, and have it part of the video uh, of our shows, but it'll, I'll also post it and uh, publish it in my article the next month and their name and uh, the model that they built and their description of the model they built and how they did it will be published in the magazine. So if you've ever wanted to be in a magazine, you ever wanted to build a model, here's an opportunity for you to get your name and model and description of what you did in a magazine. And it won't cost you anything. And Chris Course will help you because not in addition to being the owner of Connor Wingo model and producing this kit, uh, which he's giving a discount to you to buy of all of his regular price. Uh, you know, he's also the person that, that is uh, the moderator for our My Bill segments. So you build his kit, you, you send him an email and say, I want to include it in my bill. Well, he'll include it in my bill because he runs the My Bill. So it doesn't get much easier than that. And thank you so much, Chris, for. Uh, for, for coming out with this and for naming it after me. I really do appreciate it so very much. Then starting June the 1st, Bill Banner is back uh, with an ON30 caboose kit. Bill's going to build it himself. It's his kit he produces. He's giving you a discount. Uh, he, wa he wants to be a part of the show, and he wants you to build his kit. Uh, and this is the first ON30 that we've ever built on the show. It probably won't be the last. Uh, because we have a lot of interest in ON30 uh, in the hobby. So I think that it's going to be something that's going to be more and more important, particularly in the narrow gauge market, from what I hear. Uh, so this would give you an opportunity uh, to see a kit in ON30, what it's like, and uh, how to build it. And that starts June the 1st. Then July the 13th, uh, Earl Hackett is going to start teaching us how to use a free CAD program. You're going to be able to design the parts that you need. You're going to be able then to get them printed. And then Earl is going to show you how to clean them up, how to build a model using them, how to paint them. And then the people that have built the models along with Earl, I hope are going to show them to us in the My Build segments again so that we can all benefit from them. But the advantage is, whether you're an individual modeler or a small manufacturer, this is your opportunity to find a free CAD program that you can download. And, and Earl's going to talk about, I think he said, three different programs uh, and the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but not only find out what programs you can download, Earl's going to show you how to use them. So if you have questions, Earl is your crutch. He'll help you figure out how to use a 3D CAD program in order to design parts or whole models if you want to. But in this case, it's going to be a girder bridge that he's going to build. So the parts that he's going to specifically design on this CAD program are going to be all the parts needed to build a girder bridge. The 3D parts will be the only parts being used, and they'll all be designed by Earl on a free CAD program 
a, and then he'll he'll have them printed. He'll clean them up. He'll show you how to use them in the bill. He'll show you the glues to use to get them in the bill, and he'll show you what paint, paints to use and how to paint. Uh, so I don't think it get much easier than that. It's going to be a long build along because of the various segments that he's going to be covering. But I think it'll cover a lot of areas that a lot of us really need an education in. I know I do because I, I have trouble with email, as you all know. All right, so that's basically where we are with Earl and his CAD program. Uh, then on July 20th, uh, a friend of mine, Paul Egret, is going to create a card model of a service station. And it's going to be on our website. It's going to be free to download. You can download this card model in any scale you model. There'll be a scale chart on the website. All you have to do is look at the scale chart. The model shown on the website will be an HO scale. So you simply go to the scale chart chart and you, you, you transfer the, uh, the print from HO to whatever scale you're in, N, S, H, uh, O, G, whatever. And then you have it printed out. If your printer at home is able to print it out, great. If not, you may have to then uh, download a file and take it to a local print shop because of the size you need. But you'll be able to download the model, frankly, as many times as you want to for free. And then we're going to have two separate modelers on the shows showing you how to build in card. You may not understand this, but there are more ways to build in card than simply gluing card pieces together. And what you're going to see is you're going to see David Rarick come back and build a card model one way. And then you're going to see Father Ron come back and build exactly the same model, but he's going to build it using a different technique, a different way of building card models. So you're going to get a free card model out of the deal. Plus David, uh, plus uh, uh, Paul Egret, will agree that if you don't like the signage that's on it, you can contact him and he will help you get the signage that you particularly want on the size of the station, uh, service station, that you particularly are going to download. So you can change the signage, you can change the size, and you've got two modelers coming on that can be your crutch, building that model in two different ways. It doesn't get much easier than that. So I hope that if, if you've never built anything in card, give it a shot. It's the cheapest modeling you'll ever do, and it's easy to learn, and I think you'll really enjoy it. All right, moving right along. I hope you want to participate in all of these. After all, these uh, companies, these individuals are spending a lot of time and effort for free to try to help you improve your model. That's what this show is all about. We're trying to give you advice and counsel and, 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 and just show and tell things that may help you improve your modeling. That's all we're trying to do. That's what this is all about. I really think that we're making, a, making a, a, an inroad into that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be getting more people joining our shows and we wouldn't get the comments that I'm starting to get about why don't you do this? How about doing that? I'd like to do this. Can I be on the show and do that? And that's exactly what I've always hoped it would be. When Dylan Lambert and I started these two years ago, neither one of us knew what we were doing. And we got together and said, we don't care. We're going to try it. And if we're good at it, then it'll be okay. If we're not, we'll quit. Well, two years later, Dylan's moved on to something else. But you may see Dylan again uh, shortly. Uh, and I'm still doing it. Because I love this stuff. I love model building. I, I actually do. This is my life. I get up in the morning and for 13 to 16 hours a day, I either build models, work on the Zoom meeting for upcoming Zoom meetings, think about different things that I can add to the Zoom meetings that might be benefits to you, or I write the article that I publish once a month called New Tracks in the two magazines that Amy and Dan Darty allow me to write in. That's my life. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. If I can help you in whatever years I have left, in whatever way that I know how to build can do it, that's what I want to do. Best I know how. 
That's what this is all about, at least for me. And I think for most of the people that are on the management team, otherwise they wouldn't volunteer and they wouldn't put up with me to do it. And putting up with me, yeah, that's a chore. Absolutely. You just talk to my wife, she'll tell you. All right. So now I want to talk about the upcoming uh, my build. Uh, Dan Darty and his wife Amy and their company, uh, Model Railroad Resource LLC, are the sponsor for the my build program. So Ken, if we could run Dan's uh, video, please. Well, let me keep talking about it, Ken. You'll have to let me know when you're ready to run that video. Uh, uh, the, the upcoming, uh, the next one that we have is scheduled for May the 18th. Uh, and I'm not sure whether Chris, of course, is going to be in town or not. He may be out of town, uh, but he's not sure right now. If he is, he'll do it. If he's not, then uh, Phil Edholm is going to take over the show for that evening. And so if you have a model that you want to show in it uh, on, on May the 18th, uh, then contact Chris, contact Phil, and they'll make sure that your model is included uh, in the My Bill for that evening. Uh, and Welcome to the world of scale, O&S railroading. We are your resource for all O&S scale modeling. Both our magazines are advertiser supported and free to read online, download as a PDF, or even print. All advertisers are hot linked to their website so if you see something you like, just click. Please check out our websites for the current issues. All back issues available free for the O Scale Resource and the S Scale Resource magazines. And, if you are a manufacturer, distributor, or retail establishment, please contact us through our website for advertising opportunities. I would like to make a comment. The reason that I asked uh, Dan and Amy to uh, be the sponsors for the My Bill is that the philosophy and the purpose of their both of their magazines and their company is to bring modeling back into model railroading. And to me, that's exactly what my build is all about. And that's why, to me, it was just a perfect fit. Uh, and if uh, they can uh, uh, help us and we can help them, that's, uh, that's what model railroading, as far as I'm concerned, is all about. Uh, the other thing that I'll mention about his magazines, if you're not an O-scaler or S-scaler, you ought to be reading the magazines anyway. Why? Two reasons. They're free, won't cost you anything. If you don't like it, don't read it. Two, the skills and the techniques and the modeling that you learn and see in that magazine applies to any scale. I don't care what scale you model, you can benefit from looking at the people that are writing the articles and building models, because that's all the magazine's about in either one of, his mag of their magazines. So I encourage you, whether you're an O scaler or S scaler, doesn't make any difference. Try one of their magazines. Go to Google and Google S scale resource magazine or Google O scale resource magazine. And I guarantee you, you'll learn something. I don't care what scale you model. I don't care what period you model. You're going to learn something. And don't forget to read my articles because they're in each one of them. Okay, so now moving right along. Uh, for our quick tip tonight, we have Bob Farquhar. Before I turn to Bob, we've got two people that I know about that have got COVID problems. One of them is Paul Thompson. And we wish Paul all the best and get well soon. The other is uh, Pat Brevard. And Pat just came down with it. He caught it from guess who? His wife, who had it before him. And with any luck, he's going to probably give it to the rest of his family based on what he said a few minutes ago. So, Pat. Uh, we're so sorry that both of you have got it. I wish you the best to get, get well quick. And the same to you, Paul. And look forward to uh, you coming back and, and continuing uh, uh, participating in our shows. So with that said, Bob, I'll turn it over to you for your quick tip. All righty. Fairly short one this one is. Okay, here we go. 
So this stuff here is a um, galvanized metal uh, screen. It's known as a uh, hardware cloth, though I don't know why the word, the word cloth is used because it's all metal. Uh, mechanic, mechanics mesh. It comes in different sizes. This particular one is uh, half inch squares, you can see here. And for end scale, you use a quarter inch uh, type of uh, spacing, half inch for HO, three quarter inch for S, and one inch for O. And the idea is you cut it uh, like that, make the uh, fencing, or you can use it for railing on the top of a building or uh, maybe on top of a lighthouse, that type of thing. That's the, uh, the concept for it. So that's a quick date for the night. Well, I certainly do appreciate it. I think that's a wonderful tip. And you're going to be back doing this again next week, as I understand. Yep. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so very much, Bob. You really are a big help to, uh, uh, to help uh, uh, Paul out on this while he uh, recovers from uh, COVID. Yep. That's all. what it's all about, right? Absolutely. That's what model railroading is all about. Well, let me now turn to uh, Rick and Marie Hunter. And I'm sorry, Marie's got a cold tonight. So while you'll see her in the video, you won't be able to see her live after the video. So you're gonna to have to put up with guess who, Rick Hunter, by himself answering your questions after the, uh, the video is shown of his partner in crime, uh, Marine, actually building the model. So Rick, I will turn it over to you, sir. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I think I can handle this by myself. <laughs> Uh, maybe. <laughs> so uh, today we're uh, tonight we're going on to session four of our build along, and what we're actually building is this covered bridge it's, uh, produced by us, Hunter Line, and we've got the bridge basically built now, and we're going to start building the building part of it. So uh, if we have to to roll the video. That'd be great. Hi, everyone. You're with uh, Rick and Maureen from Hunterline in Cambridge, Ontario. Uh, we're on to session four of our build along for our 50 foot Queen Post covered bridge. Uh, today, we want to accomplish uh, doing the, the uh, well, let's go back a step. Your homework should have included finishing off the bridge section, just like that. So what we want to do today is uh, do the framing for the sidewalls and uh, doing the planking on the boards and uh, installing it on the side of the bridge that we just showed you. So Maureen's going to take you through the steps of building the wall. This is just exactly like framing a house. Hi, uh, first step I guess is just to get your drawing tape to your board with the uh, masking tape and put wax paper over top. It's the framing template and side view. And then what I would suggest, uh, we're not following along um, strictly as per our instructions just because of, of uh, the way we have to film this, but um, what we're going to do is cut all the pieces of the lumber that you need for that wall. So you need your 1x12s for the planking, your 6 by 6s for the posts and the bottom and top sill and your 3 by 6s uh, to do the nail strapping. So I've already got one made here because you have to really uh, let it set up before you start putting your planking on and make sure that it's really well glued. So I'm going to start first by just showing you um, how I cut these pieces. Um, I took the your six by sixes. We want to make the outer frame first. So I took the six by sixes and cut uh, the length right to the end of your drawing on each side. So this one's already cut. Okay, so remember that you have to do two of those because you're making two walls, but I've already done that. And then you want to do your top sill and you place that one right to the outside of that rafter. That's important to go to the outside because uh, the the piece you're cutting right now is actually longer than the piece on the bottom because of the, the roof structure above it. Yeah, so just go to the outside and give that a cut. Now if you've got the um, uh, Ultimation Slicer, it works great. You can um, do uh, all your pieces for both walls very quickly 
using the slicer, but for this one I'm just going to show you <clears throat> using the razor saw. So I've got the top and bottom sill. Then you need to do your, your posts. So I already had one cut here. It's perfect. And I've got my other pieces that I need to cut. I'll show you. I've got it measured. I had my first piece measured on the slicer. If you don't have a slicer, it's okay. Just um, you'll just have to measure on your drawing. So I've got the one piece all set up, and I've got three pieces here. I need four total, just for this wall. Eight for the for um, both walls. And I can actually, I just want to put a, a little slice here, cut off the end. fit that in get my next one and this one needs a little trim at the end as well Oop, there goes a finger. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Works great. Saves a lot of time, that's for sure. So I've got my four my four posts cut here. They will go in those spots. Then I, what I would suggest is cutting all your planking. So you need your um, your one by twelves to do that. And I've already got mine all cut here. I used the slicer to do that, and uh, boy, <laughs> it sure saved a lot of time. But if not, you just have to take take your 1x12s and place them on your drawing. Get the first one cut, and then you can sort of just cut off of each one. So what you're doing here is you're placing it at the top, top of your top sill, and going down to midpoint, which is... Should be this one. See, they only go to this point. Okay, I see. So that okay. this, from this to here, to the center of here, is the same distance right. as from here sorry. to the end. Yeah, not the top, so sorry. The first, the first, uh, where you see the nail strapping there, is from the top to, to the, the middle, to the midpoint of that third nail strapping. You can use your razor saw or just use an exacto knife. So if you got once once you get the first one cut, you just keep just keep cutting them. Okay. And how they're going to go is they're going to be placed top of that first nail strapping. And then from the bottom strap bottom sill right to the midpoint of that third strapping. And I'll show you how we glue those on later. You need your strapping on there too. Yeah. Look at them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you also need to cut these little angle um, posts here. There is a name for that, but geez, you think I can remember it? Angle brace you have here on the uh, it's drawing. Not a, not a corbello, it's, but it's something like that. So just Put that on your drawing and cut right underneath that top sill. Okay, you can do this on the uh, slicer as well. I already did most of mine. I did five of them, so I'm doing the sixth one. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And then you line it up with the vertical post and cut that in. So you need six of those, well, 12 total, doing um, both walls. And then you need your nail strapping. Just kind of tuck all these pieces into a nice little pile so you don't forget what belongs where. So the nail strapping. One goes along the bottom, the bottom sill. It's important here to, to notice that the length 
goes from one end to the other end. Right to like, the If you look edge. at the drawing, it sort of shows that it's they're, they go in between the posts. They don't go on in between the posts. They go entirely on top. So it's one full length for each one. So I just cut one, and then I'm going off of that one. You could use the uh, slicer as well, but just to save time here, so I don't have to reset that slicer, I'm just doing it this way. And you need five, right? One, two, three, four, five. So you need ten total for two walls. If they're a little longer or a little short, it doesn't really matter. If they're a little long, you can always file them down later. I need one more here. Oops. Cut that off here. Here we go, we've got five of them. All right, so I think that's all the lumber you need to cut before you start gluing. So what I'm gonna do is put set this outside frame. So take your top sill, place it on the top of your drawing, and the bottom one. And if I've got all my post here. Oops, ready to go. Okay, did I do all my posts? One, one, two, three, four, yep. And get your glue. And do um, the outside post first. A little dab on each end. I think I probably have a little bit too much. Once in a while we get asked, do you go from the left to the right or the right to the left? It kind of depends on if you're left-handed or right-handed. Usually a right-handed person will do just like what Marine's doing. Start on the left side and work your way across to the right. And just so that you're not constantly over something that's already starting to set up. Step. So just get them set in there. If you've got a little excess glue, just Take that off. And you want to stick something on there to hold it down. Got to get this straight. Use this as a weight and get this one set up here on the other side. Okay, and I'm going to use a couple bottles here to weight that down. So normally you would just let this set up, um, you know, good good 10 minutes at least, and uh, then you can start putting the rest of the uh, vertical posts in there. They'll just sort of go in here. It's just like doing the tie stringer assembly. You want the outside components to be rigid before you start doing all the additions to it. Yeah. I'll just stick these uh, posts in here. Just to show you, I just want to show you the nail strapping, how it goes on here. And... Oh, where'd my other one go? Oh, oh, I've got it all. That's perfect. Okay. The nail strapping. I'm just going to pretend that's all set up and glued. You need to put one all the way along the bottom sill. Put that one in. Those are strictly just strapping, just to hold the uh, the siding on. You can see how much easier it would be <laughs> if I had those posts set up and glued. But just to give you the idea here, then the rest of the strapping, just follow your drawing. I just put a dab of glue on. The vertical posts here.
and you work your way up. Okay, so you'll be going just right to the top. I've got two more to do, and they would be going there. Okay, and that's what it should look like. And then let that really set up and dry. But I'm going to continue on with the wall that I've already got made and show oh, you. Oh, yeah, and the sorry, the uh little uh, angle braces here forgot you have to put those all along so put a little dab of glue on each end and attach them one to the top cell underside of the top cell and the one side of the vertical post so they will go all the way across just like that so I'm just going to move this. I know it's not set. I'll have to finish that later. And put this wall that's already set up in its place. So you can see I've got all the strapping down. I've started putting my um, boards on. And here's where you can get a little bit creative. You can um, break these boards, put some missing ones in. Um, se several ways to do that. You can just take the board and you can twist it somewhere and pull. That's called warping. Is that called warping? <laughs> and you'll have a you'll have an edge that's uh, you know looks like it's um, been ripped away. Um, you can also take a little snip if you want a wire snip. Um, go at the bottom of them. Might not want to do this with all of them. It's quite a few that you have to do it with. But put little cuts in it. You can take a tweezer and pull some of those out. So you have little notches. I don't know if you can see that. Um, leave blanks, leave some planks off, whatever. But what we do is we start at the top. So you're starting at that um, first nail strapping, and I just put well, maybe a third of the a way across. Start at the top and work your way down and just start putting the planks on. You want to put it again so that it's pretty much touching the top of that sill and midpoint on that third row of nail strapping. Try and make sure they're vertical. If they're gappy, don't worry about it because the real ones are gappy. Yeah, it's okay to leave spaces. And if they're uneven at the top, that's okay too. If it's, if it's really noticeable, um, when it's all dried, you can just flip it over and uh, trim them off with an X-Acto knife. Couldn't close my tweezers. I got a piece of wood stuck in there. <laughs> um, here I'm going to stick a board that I ripped in that place. Just scrape off any uh, excess glue with your tweezers and just glue those boards along. It takes a little bit of time, a little bit of patience. You can be creative. Mm -hmm. You can already see the difference in the different shades of, of uh, the planking. Yeah, it was all done in um, light gray, but uh, you know that each of the boards is uh, from a different part of the tree, so it all comes out different. So I do a little bit, and then I go to the bottom and put a row underneath it. After a little bit too long, don't worry about it. Yeah, I always take that off later. Here looks like a board that's uh, been kind of ripped down the side. So I'm going to put that in and take out the glue in between the board here. Yeah, so just get a little creative. 
and the bottom ones should line up pretty much with the top ones because that's the way it would be in uh, in the new construction end of it. the space here. I don't know, maybe a big tree came along and there. This is over a well, probably waterfall. Probably <laughs> some kid went along and, and <laughs> kicked it. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave a space there. We lost it somehow anyway. <laughs> there you go, so you can get the idea. Just, just get creative and maybe you want it to be a brand new bridge and you want it with no spaces or no bro broken boards and that's okay too. So then I would let that set up and dry and I'm going to do a little bit of dry brushing show you what I do. So you want to get a paper towel and your cheap dollar brush. I would put my gloves on. And I'm going to dry brush, um, I think, a little bit of brown on here. I've got a medium brown. And I think I'll use that. And then I might show you, it'll probably show up a little bit better, um, some barn, barn red. This, this is what we call a highlight color. Like The base color was light gray, and now she's putting... Medium. A medium brown on top of it. So put so, your take your brush and just th put it in is, the bottle. This is not a process to make it a solid color. And you it's dab just to start to highlight it. Dab most of the stain off and then just start adding a little bit of brown here and there. Anywhere. Yeah, we just go light to start with and because you can always make it darker. Yeah. And there's no set rules. This is what your eye beholds. Yeah, don't be too fussy, just And like afterwards if you want to do more, you can. So I think you can see those colors popping out now. Yep. So there's the brown. You can see that pretty good? Yeah. I, I think I don't want to put red on this one. I'm going to leave it with just the uh, brown. See, I said before that a lot of this is uh, mood artistry. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> Maureen's mood is, what she puts on it and how much of it. Mm, I don't feel like using red today, so <laughs> I'm just going to put the brown on. And then what you can do, whatever color you choose, it doesn't matter. And you can put as many coats as you want on of different colors. It, there's no, there's no well, limit. Why Maureen said red is a lot of these were red, um, uh, or tungsten brown, I guess is the the word. But um, we we have all sorts of colors that you can use on this. Right now, I'm going to take my black, my creosote black, and dab off. A lot of it because what I want to do is is put um, some shadows and maybe where the moisture might be on these bridges so I'm going to take it and dry brush up from the bottom this is coming from knowing what these bridges look like they, they always seem to be very deteriorated at the bottom and the top is because of the uh, overhang it's a shadow now you can't see the shadow now until the roof gets on, but you can start to apply it now. And you, yeah, you would see at the top too, it would be a little bit darker under the eaves. So I'm going to put some up there. This will dry a little bit lighter. That's why we say you can always go back and add it later at mm -hmm. any stage of the game. Oh, I think that's looking good. I like that. 
Mm -hmm. So that gives you a little bit of an idea how to add your colors. Okay. Yep. Good. All right. So then the next part is just attaching this wall to your bridge. So where you're going to attach it. And this is where all your end shims and your cords when they're sticking out. This is what uh, the wall structure sits on. So you're going to put glue on the end shims on the cord, top of the cords. Okay. Also along the vertical posts here on your bridge and across the top cord. You can do it there too. Um, well actually, let me see. Put this on. And they're not going to touch it. Yeah, it's not going to touch it. So just at the top, if you just follow that vertical post right up to, wait a minute, follow that vertical post right up to the top of the cord, um, you'll hit, you'll make contact up there. Okay. The important thing is here is just to make sure that when you get that attached that it's at a right angle. It's, and it's plumb. Plumb, is that what you say? Yeah. Plumb is up and down. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it's plumb. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's do that. We'll get the glue on here. So on the top of the engine, cords. Can you see that? I don't... There, okay. Along the uh, vertical post, right up to the top of the cord. Put a line there. All right. And get your wall and make sure those vertical posts line up, and it's even on the ends, and it's making contact with your end shims. And I can turn it on its, this way and just I'm going to check to see oops, that it is plumb. Looks good. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. My one end here is wanting to uh, uh, move outwards a little bit, so I'm just holding it here for a few minutes to keep it keep it in. Looks vertical to me. Yeah, everything looks like it's in contact. So you'll just need to let that set up, and you're going to do the other wall the exact same way, because next week we're going to do the rafters and attach those and. Trust me, you want this to be really set and dry before we get to that point. So, so that means you have a lot of homework yeah. to do. <laughs> so I think that's that's it. Think so, Rick? I think so. Uh, yeah. Just uh, the important part there is that that wall is vertical mm. and, uh, or plumb because that can make a big difference in all the rest of the steps. That's one of the things about building is you got to be, the more accurate you are to start with, the more easier it is at the end to fit stuff. So yes, get the two walls on there and let them set up uh, for, for the next session. Yep. And uh, hey, the, <laughs> it's starting to look really good. Yeah. And it's good. not that complicated of a, of a, a thing so far. It looks great. Looking good, guys. Thank you. So uh, we'll see you next week. Um, enjoy. Thanks. Well, boy, Rick, she does better every every week. She gets better and better, I think. You know, she must have taken acting lessons. <laughs> She's a registered nurse retired, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we say about our weathering mix is she, she's uh, all her life. She's injected things. So when we make the weathering mix, she's injecting it all the time because she <laughs> likes that. But um, that wall that we just did, 
there's what the finished one actually looks like. And you can see how the eave has a shadow on it. Now I can put it into the light, but um, you can see the, the uh, at the bottom there, how it's a little darker and mm -hmm. the shadow going around underneath. So yeah, we're coming along really good on it. Um, we're getting lots of comments about it, and this is good. And I'll mention again, as I did a few minutes ago, if the people that are building along with uh, with Rick and Marie on this uh, 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 model, if you include your model in the uh, the my build later, not only do you get everybody to uh, to see it on the uh, the show, but it'll also be in my magazine article. So I, you know, it's a two for for you as far as I can see uh, to try to show the people. <laughs> What, what's possible and, and how you you took a kit and made it yours. Because it, as yeah. it can, from what I see, you can build this any way you want to. It's up to you. It can be a new bridge, an old bridge, an in-between bridge, whatever you want it to be. You have the capability of building it like that. And I personally would like to see your creativity and how you built it. You agree, Rick? Absolutely. Uh, use your imagination. Like, like this doesn't have to be rocket science, you know. Like, uh, uh, be creative on it. Uh, if you want to do this to it, do it. <laughs> let's, let, let's face it. That's the art of model railroading. People don't talk about the yeah. art of model railroading much, but that's what it is. It's your imagination. It's your creativity. That's what you bring it's to your... everything you build. It's your artistry. It's three-dimensional art, and that's what you're building. Ours is just a guide. That's it. I mean, he's giving you the parts. He's giving you how to build it. He's showing you on, on, on this screen right now the steps to go through to build a beautiful model. But the art of it comes from you. He doesn't provide you that. <laughs> All right. Moving along. Rick, thanks so much, and, and I hope, uh, hope Marie gets better soon. Thanks, Jim. Talk to you later. Yes, sir. Thank you. Before I go to uh, Jim Murphy and, and uh, the, uh, the, the bill that he's doing on the Nighthawk Cafe, I want to mention something. I have a Facebook page. It's called Jim Kello MMR. J-I-M-K-E-L-L-O-W-M-M-R. Uh, I have a bet with somebody uh, to see who gets to a certain point of followers on their uh, Facebook page first. And naturally, I want to win that. If you haven't ever been to my Facebook page, I hope you'll visit it. Uh, because that between the shows, that's, who I that's where I talk to people. Uh, I'll post something, either a model that I have built, uh, pictures of different things that I'm involved with, uh, and I'll normally get anywhere from, I don't know, two to 20 comments from different people about whatever I post. And I'll probably get anywhere from 100 to 600 likes or love for the pictures or whatever I post on my site. So if you've never been there, I hope you'll visit it. It's Jim Kello, MMR. And I hope you'll hit follow and follow the site uh, to help me win this bet. Anyway, I mentioned that, and I hope that you'll do it. Thank you for your help if you do. I've got 2,675 followers right now. Uh, I had to start this page, by the way, because in my other page, they cut me off at 5,000 uh, friends, so I couldn't use that page anymore. Uh, so that one's full. Uh, this is, so I had to start this one, and I've got 2,675 on it right now. So... I'm looking for more followers to win the bet. Anyway, and I know that you'll enjoy, I think you'll enjoy keeping up with what's happening between our shows. Uh, so with that said, I want to turn to uh, Jim Murphy, uh, building the, uh, the Nighthawk Cafe by Wit and Wisdom Models. And uh, Jim, it's all yours, sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my screen. I think I've got it. Okay, I am. Uh, hopefully, you can see my screen right now. Yes, sir. 
All but right, I, excellent. But I, don't, but I don't see it full screen, I don't think, Jim. I don't know why. Oh, but okay. It's just the way it's, it's cropped on the side there, but it should come out all right. Uh, before I begin, my compliments to uh, Jim's earlier presentation. It was almost Shakespearean. Good acting, <laughs> Jim. Carry on. <laughs> Let's begin. Uh, well, hello, all you Nighthawks out there. Welcome to another session of new tracks and the wit and wisdom model of John Armstrong's famous Nighthawks Diner. We're back in New York City and ready to get these folks a cup of coffee and some other details that we'll add to the inside of the diner. Given us a chance, we'll start doing the details. Thank goodness for removable roofs. Now that we have pulled the roofs off and we can start work on the diner, which is shown in the corner here on the right side, and get into that uh, detailing the diner. First, take all your window castings and plastic castings, the standard drill, cut them off at the screws, and then use a flat sanding paper. Uh, I like one glued to a piece of uh, hard laminate, and that uh, trims up all the corners, sands them out nice and smooth. After cutting, put them in some detergent, a little bit of warm water, and an old brush, and wash off all the fingerprints, the oils, the release materials that are on there. After the wash, you want to rinse a couple of times with clear tap water. Notice that the sink stopper is closed. Every time you do this, you're in the sink. The stopper is closed so your parts don't go out. After a distilled water rinse, shake the parts out on a clean towel and let them dry overnight. Don't touch them at this point. After they come out of the distilled water rinse, you should be wearing gloves. After they've thoroughly dried, usually overnight, start assembling them, again with gloves on, to put them into the paint booth. Try to spray as much as you can at one time, saves cleaning the airbrush. So all the green parts go in at one time. I happen to use an old Floquil dark green. Uh, Vallejo also makes some very good airbrush colors that will match the color in the painting. Now that we're going to start adding some windows, we just very light cleanup. No more than the thickness of paint needs to be removed, but you do need to check that every window fits in the right opening without any binding. Put a little pressure sensitive adhesive PSA available from Micromark. My favorite glue for putting the windows in. Uh, once it's dry, the glue just gets, has to be pushed in. And on the back side, you've already got a little bit of adhesive there ready to accept the glazing. That's going to fit on the inside of the windows. Make sure everything's painted before you do any of the insertion here. Okay, who can find the problem with this one? Yes, if you look really close, one window has the sill on top, the other window has the sill on the bottom. This is what happens when you start going too darn fast. So correct it. Uh, fortunately, the PSA can be pushed out easily with uh, no problem. Uh, put a little fresh PSA on it and stick your windows back in correctly. Same applies for the glazing. I've applied a little bit of pressure sensitive adhesive to the inside of the window frames. The glazing has been washed with uh, detergent Windex and that's ready to go in. Here's the, the finished product on one end. Uh, we're gonna start doing the molding that goes around the outside. It's a, a concrete simulation. I like to use uh, 20,000 styrene. So give everything a coat of paint ahead of time, all the loose styrene in the corners. I like angle 
and a 60 thousandths on a side angle. And then you trim it off in your chopper so it's the right length for each location. And this is a homemade chopper, but it works just fine. Measure it. Uh, because the ends will appear white in the styrene, give them a little touch with a marker so that you give it that gray color. Sometimes the molding will stick up just enough that it can be seen and ruin the effect. Start building up vertically first, then add the horizontals. Make note that underneath the door, you've got to do a little finagling and take away some of the molding so the door fits the right elevation. The side walls are going to get some extra window treatments and door treatments. So before you assemble anything, test fit, make an opening as we talked about at the last session for opening for the rear door and we're going to have a storefront area. This is just going to be a DPM storefront that we're going to add in the side there. Make sure that hole's cut before we start. Start getting your painting, all your painting done ahead of time. Remember, you're going to paint both sides here. So the door, doors get primary on one side, then a final coat of green, and another coat. For the larger pieces, get out your uh, styrene or acrylic, tape it to your cutting board, sharp knife, straight edge, make your clean cuts, and then you're ready to put glazing. Here's the inside of the new storefront door. It's got glazing uh, across the storefront. It's got uh, translucent material over the transom and in the stairwell. Here's the detail of the stairwell because that's going to be illuminated and you're going to need the stairwell to get to the upper floors. The left side of this door happens to be accessed for a second floor. All this will show through. You can see the stair steps. Uh, the transom will glow nicely and the three windows over the center are over the storefront. That will be added to the side and a little more interesting detail. Here is the, uh, the front entrance of the diner and the entrance to the upper floor in the center and then the door, double door for the new structure. Cut your signs out with a sharp, sharp knife. I like a scalpel and a straight edge. It nice clean cuts off of the uh, paper sheet. Glue the signs onto pre-painted sign holders, uh, leaving enough so there's an even edge around the outside. These are going to be mounted on the top of the diner roof, which we've already have reinforced. That's painted green as well. So all of this is pre-painted for final assembly, and we'll be adding the Philly sign on top. I like to use a little white glue, position it exactly where you want it, and there, top and bottom in the center of where it's at, add a weight to it and let it set overnight. I also added a little weight underneath it to keep it level so that the weight doesn't slide off the top. The next step is going to be looking at the sign. We have uh, a small ventilator that's been added on top. That's to uh, provide us an easy lift off. You'll notice there's a little gap on the right hand side of the roof there. That is actually an overhang and it's going to set on top of the other vents. Uh, let's see some 3D printed details. The water tank uh, just needs to be removed from the carrier piece, which is down below. The ends are sanded 
so that the tank is parallel and all at right angles. So quick sanding helps here. Sand the uh, primered legs for the water tower. Finish them off with a file to get all those edges nice and smooth. Doesn't have to be perfect because it is a wood structure. Here the base plate and the uh, stand pipe are added. You've got to have a way of getting the water out of the tank. That's the purpose of it. And the four legs put together. You also have to fill the water tank. So you need a filler pipe. I used a uh, scale two inch brass tube bent, uh, which is about appropriate to fill a tank of this size. So here it's mounted to the roof. The filler pipe is seen there. Weather up the, uh, the water tower, put it up, glue it up to the chimney. That pipe is drilled through the roof, so it also helps hold it in place. Now we're gonna start to get into the diner with the counter on the right hand side. That's, so we fit, fit it up, the base of it, sand the counter very carefully. There is a little bit of roughness on the edges. So you wanna sand it carefully, get it all square, uh, the round corners as well, sand them gently. Again, I like a sandpaper glued to a rigid piece of plastic. Makes a very handy flat sander. Okay, we have a problem here. Nobody might recognize it, but yes, it's inside out. These uh, sides of the counter were glued on the wrong side. It's called reading the directions. Okay, when you take them off and you put them on the other side, the counter will be in the correct orientation to mount in the center of the diner. The next step is to glue the trim on the counter base. That's just done with a fine white glue applicator. Stick it up close there and apply it to the sides. Finished dimensions look that you may, somebody may have picked up on the fact that I cut the right side of this counter back by, oh, about a quarter of an inch. So that it actually be an aisleway in front of the entrance to the diner. And it shows here where the cash register is right up on the edge. Uh, up above in the picture, you see the uh, trim has been added to the counter and the whole counter structure has been given a coat of paint at this point. Still haven't applied the uh, top. We're gonna work that separately. But get the bottom done. Now cover the details, study the faces. This is a blow up of the actual painting and this is what we're gonna use to start painting. I make no bones about it. I'm not an expert painter. First you primer. And we discovered one problem. Uh, these are very fragile castings, handle them. So it seems that Trixie has lost her arm. Uh, a little bit of sacrifice from another plastic figure and some patience. And she got an arm to uh, hold up as it is in the painting. You can see on the left here, Trixie has her arm back. And we're starting the painting, working on Trixie and Bruno and the counter boy and Frank, all there uh, together. Go patient. I find a 10 on brush and some Vallejo colors is the best way to approach all of this. And uh, just be patient. It can be done. Yeah, there's a motorcycle in the distance. Uh, I was about to put the stools in and started mounting them in. This is not the one I used. So you, uh, I used a reamer to open the holes very, very slightly. Is there a tad undersized? But my, uh, my surprise, I put in the stools 
and they were too low. There's an error in the directions on the HO set that says make the stool stand three sixteenths of an inch. Uh, problem, it should be five sixteenths. There was a typo. So uh, by this point, I'd already made all the stools up. So start from scratch, and I made five sixteenths long uh, stanchions for the stools. Uh, cut a bunch of those, I used a piece of plastic tubing, and my Micromark miter box, these tiny saws are invaluable. And uh, it's a good investment. They're only about 20 bucks for the saw and the miter. The stool sets, I went to the old fashioned. This is my grandfather's leather punch and some of the uh, stock uh, that came in the, in the kit. So I punched out uh, tool seats using the, the circular punch, and then reinstalled 5 sixteenths long stools. And I like red leather, so there's a preference there. Uh, in my town, they were always red. So mounting them into the reamed holes, put them on a flat surface. Be careful with them. Try to get them all s sitting up straight. It's a challenge, but it's easy to do. And now you've got the stools in place and ready to uh, let other people come in and sit down. So here we got the details. Everybody's all uh, in position. The counter is painted. The coffee urns. There is uh, uh, the ashtrays are done in translucent green paint so they look dark in the center and clear at the rims. Napkin holders were the biggest challenge. That was done with a, a Vallejo silver paint. And just to make it interesting, we added an extra man. Remember, this is six weeks after Pearl Harbor. So uh, Lieutenant Sullivan, U.S. Army, is uh, having a beer uh, late at night and just contemplating what's going to happen uh, when he gets shipped out as he knows he's going out. Anyway, so we have a closing here. We have the inside. Needed to put a few extra odds and ends inside there to make it happen. Now we go to the outside of the building and we needed a fire escape. Uh, there was a ladder supplied with the kit but my background is in uh, construction and uh, site safety. So I've had many an inspection of fire escapes and second egresses from an elevated floor. This is made from titchy parts and scrap, just some old pieces cobbled together, cut it to a rough length. Uh, it's gonna be mounted outside the door of the second floor and then it will access a ladder that either goes to the roof for roof access or straight down to the ground as a fire escape. Once you've assembled the homemade platform and a ladder piece of ladder stock, again, this is titchy leftovers, but make sure it'll fit and the little wiggle at the top, as you remember, I've got to dodge the roof. Okay, off the paint booth, it's a coat of red paint, so it'll stand out. This will all be heavily weathered. Uh, note again that that upper part of the ladder has to come towards us just a smidge so it'll miss the roof, and I can still remove the roof for further detailing. Up on the side, we've got the one end wall where the uh, masonry has already been added. Uh, a little detail shot here of the water tank all installed. Start to weather up the chimney, put a little slime, a little splash of soot on the chimney. We'll do it up later. Uh, here, the masonry is all in place on the side of which I'm calling the alley side. The sidewalk is in place and there's light weathering on that, added cracks. Here's the detail of the door, just a teaser about how things are gonna be illuminated. 
in the next session, but just it helps, helps emphasize the recess of this door if you got the light on there. Again, this side view, you can see cracks in the sidewalk, which would be very typical. And that piece will fit very nicely and it butts up against pieces that will wrap around the building. Looking at the end of the building, we see the, the Phillies extension on the roof. Uh, you can see inside to the stools and up above, you've got the roof details and the masonry details, the trim. Here's the side wall with the new doors added. On the left is the entrance to the Nighthawks. On the right is a storefront and stairs access to the upper floors. Looking at the, the top, we see the skylight and here's a view of the top of the fire escape slash access to the roof. And just simple arrangement there and taking a nice close look inside here's Trixie and Frank and the counter boy and Bruno and Lieutenant Sullivan having a beer inside the, the Nighthawks Cafe here's a shot showing yes we do know what the we want to keep the picture in context and uh, always keep that lined up so that we know exactly where our, uh, our our people are in New York City. Here's our Nighthawks. Jim, I can't thank you enough. I think that is one beautiful model. Oh, having fun with it. That's what counts. Absolutely, but you're you're helping a lot of people too, Jim. Yeah, that's a. It's uh, it takes a lot of patience, but the uh, uh, the reward is certainly there. And uh, I'm gonna uh, you know carry on with that. And uh, the next uh, the next plan will be for some the uh, other buildings as we go across the alley to uh, the uh, that one I wanted to stop here. Yeah, we're going to go across the street to the alley, to the uh, the hardware store, the barber shop, and some other additions there, and then to the factory, which is the backdrop building, and we'll expand ourselves the next time around. Uh, any questions on the the build so far? Hope I haven't lost too many people. Are you, are you going to talk about how you lighted the diner? Uh, yes, that will be. Uh, Episode four, I believe, is on uh, on lighting, uh, and we're going to talk about lighting the inside of the diner, the inside of the building, the lights on the outside of the building, and uh, the uh, inside of the factory, which if I can get uh, uh, my tricky pixels to work, uh, I may be able to animate the lighting in there, but everybody loves a challenge. So yes, uh, one, one entire evening will be just spent on the uh, pyrotechnics of it all. Um, not to take away from your uh, build here, but the past Saturday show on the structure building, uh, the vast majority of the show was dedicated to three different uh, modelers showing uh, lighting and we covered uh, basically the art of lighting uh, and then a very simplistic look at the, the electronics uh, and then also a couple of quick how, how they install the lightings to give a couple of different examples. So uh, those that uh, may be interested in lighting may want to take a look at the uh, past Saturdays show here on and Saturday you can find, for Scratch you can find that show on our YouTube channel, New Tracks Modeling. And uh, while I'm talking <laughs> about that, hello? Yeah, you're okay, Jim. I thought I heard somebody else wanting to talk. Well, the more the merrier as far as the lighting and the uh, 
uh, electronics going. There's such a variety of, of, of lighting tools and equipment out there. Like even, uh, even a year ago, there wasn't all the availability out there. So I'll, uh, I'll touch base, uh, a little bit on that and some of the ones. And, uh, if we dare, we may be able to even throw in the soundtrack. That, uh, I think that would be fantastic. I look forward to that show uh, tremendously, Jim. Thank you so very much. Okay, so we got one more of Building Build and then to Electronics and then we wrap it up and weather it. Fantastic. Look forward to it because it's a beautiful model. Well, now I've got something really different. Uh, Bob Davidson and Rick Massey are going to talk about something that I had never heard about before <clears throat> called Elevated Subway. Now, I've heard of Subway, but I have never heard of Elevated Subway. And when Bob first told me about this and, and showed me some pictures of his models, and I talked to, uh, to Rick and I said, I, I just don't understand what this is about, and asked him to come on the show and talk about uh, the, the uh, ITLA uh, modeling and, and also how Bob uh, did his, to me, this is something that, that all of us can benefit from. So it was something totally different in modeling for me and I think maybe for some of you. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to you guys and uh, thank you so much for being here this evening. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, Nick, I guess I'll share my screen. Okay, Bob, go ahead. And can everybody see that? Yes, sir. Very good. And you can hear me. So that's even better. Yes, sir. Um, so this is the title of this is Bondling an Elevated Railway using ITLA scale model kits. I'd like to just say at the beginning that uh, I know, Jim, you always stress the relationships that we have with the vendors. And uh, I can't say enough about how integral a, a part of this project Nick was and um, just helpful and and encouraging and uh, real quality product but more than that he's a real quality human being and I can't thank him enough and I think you'll see that some of the things that we worked out together are pretty exciting so uh, what I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes talking about the basic layout that I have and then we'll get into the into the uh, elevated section. So the name I lay out is Gowanus and Northern Railway. And the first question I usually get is what's a Gowanus? <laughs> and uh, the Gowanus <laughs> was a uh, creek that was then dredged and turned into a canal in the borough of Brooklyn in New York City, which is where I was born and grew up. Uh, it dates back uh, to the well before the Revolutionary War. Actually, if you read some of the accounts of the Revolutionary War, they talk about the fighting that occurred around the Gowanus Creek. Uh, later on, after it was dredged and turned into the canal, it was a highly uh, industrial section. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of tugboats down there on the left and a lot of industry. But it was also primarily used for transport from Brooklyn, which was at that time a separate city, uh, to transport goods from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So uh, here's a good shot. This is from 1935. And you can actually see a railroad trestle in the background there and some of the barges that were bringing uh, materials back and forth between the two boroughs. So the layout itself, um, I knew I wanted to do a scenic layout versus operations. I'm more of a scenic kind of guy. Uh, I wanted to do a cityscape with a bunch of just local switching and also have a yard. I wanted to include an elevated subway line, which I know is an oxymoron. Um, and I wanted it to have a maintenance of way facility, which in my case is going to be a maintenance of way for the uh, MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Association. And then I also wanted to utilize existing kits. I had had a model uh, or layout about 25 years ago, and then we moved and I never set one up in the house we were in. And then we just moved 
And I started doing this again. So basically I decided to do this freelance and not prototypical. So this was one of the layouts I looked, like, looked at initially, the Southern Cross. Uh, I didn't like the way the big crossover on the left-hand side, but I did like the yard and I liked the basic layout. I have a 12 foot by eight foot space that I worked in. Then I looked at this French Broad Valley layout, which seemed to operationally fit more to what I <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to do. But the big question was, how can I include and construct an elevated subway? And lo and behold, thanks to New Tracks, um, one of the uh, train shows, Nick Masney was on, uh, folks from it ITLA, and uh, there it is. He makes an elevated railway structure, the L, such as they have in Chicago and uh, still have in New York, no longer in Manhattan, but it still operates in Queens and in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. Um, so I was kind of all set and ready to go. So I started uh, tweaking the layouts and this is what I finally came up with. So this is what the Gowanus in Northern looks like. This red that you see at the top, that's the elevated line. Uh, here's the maintenance away yard over on this side. I have a bunch of freight uh, and industries over here to do some freight switching. And then this gray section represents where I'll be modeling the Go on this canal. So I was doing some research. A uh, couple of really good sites that I found on the internet was uh, the South Brooklyn Railway, uh, which is a railway that still operates in Brooklyn. Uh, mostly there is some freight work and they also transport uh, subway cars and stuff like that when they come in for the system. And then the New York City Model Transit Association, this is a group of modelers um, that has just been an invaluable resource as well. And here's some photographs that I found. So you can see what just some of the track conditions are in Brooklyn. These are all in Brooklyn. Um, so I'll be using this when I <clears throat> finish off the yards and start doing the weathering and stuff like that. This is a shot that was actually taken at the Gowanus Canal <clears throat> Nick thinks this is a narrow gauge. You can see the steam engine way back. And if you look at the uh, barge that's there, it's the Goodwin Gallagher Sand and Gravel Company, whose address was 61 Broadway in New York, New York. Uh, this is a small yard that I found actually, which is located in Brooklyn. So they do have railroads in New York City. Uh, then on to the subway research. Uh, this is an interesting picture. This is the Third Avenue L. Um, this is actually looking downtown and you can see there's tracks. You can see a station uh, here in the background. What's really interesting and I pointed out to Nick is if you see these surface tracks and if you look closely, you can see there's a groove. Back in 1870, New York installed a cable car railway that ran up Third Avenue from City Hall all the way up to 120th Street. Uh, so it was just, it's a two track cable car. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, this is a photograph I found that really uh, gave me the clues that I needed for color and for finish on the, on the model that I was gonna do of the elevated. Here's another shot that shows uh, the street view underneath because I, the elevated is placed on a, on a city street. And then a couple of shots of stations because I would have a station as part of this run. So there you go. <clears throat> so the basic layout real quick, I uh, built some walls, did the framework, got everything decked out, began laying out home bed. I had a ton of home bed left over from a previous from my old layout, started laying in tracks. Uh, here you can see the background image uh, by my vocation is as a graphic designer and exhibit designer. I found this photograph, it's a panorama of the Brooklyn uh, and I was able to uh, have that printed from one of our printers and it's uh, three feet by 21 feet. And that wraps around the whole backside of the, of the uh, layout. And here you can see this is a finished uh, track work is all done and 
uh, the background's up. So now it was time to start looking at the elevated. Uh, this is the switching. I also use the uh, touch switches that I, you know, Barrett Hill that uh, I actually saw on this show too. So pretty cool. So the elevated line itself, there were several design issues. Um, integration with the surface track. So the uh, elevated crosses over the, the surface tracks in several places. So I needed to be very well aware of that and uh, look at how we would do that. Uh, since it's 12 feet long, I needed to have separate modules. I knew I couldn't build it all as one piece. And then how to do the fabrication of something this large and finish it all so that it's a consistent finish. And then how can I control this whole thing so that it would work uh, with, uh, you know, with a, a, a degree of uh, certainty. So those were all things that we had to work on. So first the integration with the surface track um, from Nick, I was able to uh, get some dimensions of the trestles that support the track. And what I did was drafted them up on uh, my computer at work and then printed them out on cardstock and was then able to set this up as a trial layout so that I could see how it would integrate with the surface track. So you could see this is fairly early on. Uh, that's that uh, Walter's allied rail service building there that'll be part of the maintenance away facility. Um, so this helped me just determine that I was on the right, uh, you know, moving in the right direction. Once I had some components of the kit built, I did the same thing. I kept going back and making sure that everything would fit around the track. And you'll see this a little later in the presentation. So the need for separate modules, uh, I decided to split it into four modules. The module one is a five span, which is an end and reverse unit. Uh, module two is a three span, which is a station. Module three is a four span, which is a curve. And module four is a two span, which is the other end and reverse. So how to do the connections between them so that everything would kind of line up and be in one piece. So the way that uh, the ITLA uh, girders go together is they're made up out of four pieces. There's two flange pieces that go on the outside and then two web pieces that form the uh, backing of the, of the beam. So what I did was decide to just split them. So I built them as two halves rather than one solid beam. And here you can see that this is how I did that. So each of those beams, and there were four locations, three locations, I guess, um, have the, the split beams. There's another picture that shows that a little bit better. So then the question was, how do we hold them together? This photo shows a finished section with the, with the column and everything. So how do we hold them together? And the simplest answer was to use refrigerator magnets. So these are eight millimeter by two millimeter uh, rare earth magnets that I got off of Amazon. You can see they are very affordable. And what they do is I use them on the cross girders they fit perfectly into the structure and are kind of masked by some of the cross bracing. And what they do is connect each module. Uh, they form a, a very strong actual joint between each module. So the next issue was how can I then make sure the track alignment, because the magnets hold everything together, but I wanted to make sure that everything would stay in, in line left to right. And the solution for that were these model tech rail aligners. They come over from the uh, United Kingdom. I saw them on a, on a actually on the DCC guy uh, YouTube channel. And here's how they use them uh, to base obviously to join modules, you know, in module modular uh, setup. Well, here, here you can see how I use them on my layout on, on the elevated. You can see the two tracks. I only have one track live, but I built two tracks for future expansion. Finished two tracks. So now it was time for fabrication and finishing. 
Uh, these are all the component parts of, of the uh, elevated. So first columns, uh, the columns come from ITLA on the carrier sheet. Uh, there's two columns per sheet. At the top, you can see there's some gussets and then glue blocks and the base block. So separated all the parts, glued the glue box, uh, blocks to one side of the column. And you can see here there's tabs and notches. Everything is so well and so preci precisely cut that uh, it all really goes together so easily. Uh, so here I've added in the second uh, side of the column and the third side of the column and finally the fourth side of the column. And then I made up just a little jig using a weight and a steel square so that I could place the uh, gusset in there and make sure that it was at a right angle. And then the base blocks were made up out of two pieces. I stacked them and glued them. And then I used my ultimation sander and chamfered all the edges and you have a finished, uh, a finished base block, which was painted as concrete. And here you can see a finished column. Next were what I call the trestle girders. So again, the four components, they get glued together. Uh, these images are from Nick, thank you. And uh, here you can see here some of the girders after they've been painted. Then the spanner girders, again, four pieces, two flanges and two webs. So you glue a flange to a web, glue the webs together, put the other flange on, and then I have one of those Micromark uh, magnetic assembly jigs. So everything gets pressed together. And here's your final spanner column. There's uh, 14 spans, each one has four of these. So that's 56 of these. Uh, there are 30 columns, uh, and, uh, 15 cross uh, trestle girders. So there's a lot of parts. So finishing, um, I kind of went the simple, quick and dirty route here, used a lot of rattle can. So the primer you see on the right is, the, is a Krylon Color Max. Uh, I use that for just about everything. Dries real flat, real co really color receptive, uh, good hiding quality. Uh, then you see the little jar and the other spray can. Uh, one of the things that I was able to do was match the color of all the steel work and the elevated uh, through what we call PMS system, the Pantone matching system, which is a color system that's used in commercial printing. Um, and I was able to get some spray paint made up for in that color in a flat. And this is the company that I use. I've used these folks at work and uh, highly recommend them. They can match any color, uh, any swatch book of paint, uh, any ink colors, uh, just about anything. And they will do brush or spray. Uh, the minimum order is three spray cans and uh, it's really quite reasonably priced. I think I was talking with Nick, I don't think these can be shipped to Canada though. So, but there may be something up in Canada that uh, y'all could use. And then I used Dr. Martin's India inks to do some of the aging uh, on this, well, actually to do all the aging. So we'll get into that in, right now. So the first step was uh, priming everything. Uh, this is just a, one of the spanner girders. As soon as the primer is dry, um, to the touch, I put the finished coat on it. I did not let it cure, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, once the finished coat is on there, I let it all dry. And here you can see, here's the a finished beam ready for some weathering. So it's one ounce of uh, isopropyl, five drops of black, and three drops of green. And you literally soak it. Um, brush it on both sides, uh, let one side dry, let the other, because this is a stress skin, basically a stress skin assembly. It doesn't warp. Uh, I would, you know, I put a weight on them just to keep them in place, but 
uh, they're incredibly stable. And yeah, if you, Nick is showing us the, the piece there. And then once it dries, you can see, you get this really neat weathering effect. It kind of puddles in next to all the uh, flanges. Um, it was just really easy and really quick because there was a lot to do. And this is the same technique I used on all of the components. When I said about not letting the uh, primer cure, here's why. If you look at, this is a shot up from the bottom. What happens when you do that India ink stuff is it actually eats away at some of the paint and you wind up with an automatic chipping and uh, uh, rust. So that's the actual, that's the color of the wood showing through that looks like rust. So it was a real easy way to do that. And only did it on the top and the bottoms, on the end grain of the, of the uh, wood. So that was just a really nice kind of discovery in doing a, in working on this. Here you can see just a little detail painting I did on some of the columns to match the photograph that you see there in the lower right. Uh, they had to paint those so that folks wouldn't run into them with their cars, I guess, so. Next was module assembly. Uh, once I had all the parts. So here you can see I used a, a standard door. You could have a hollow cord, extra hollow cord door around the house. Put it up on some saw horses. Use the six foot level as a straight edge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then cut up some spacers and went to town putting the all of these uh, trestle girders with the spanner girders, built up that assembly, and then started laying on the uh, all the ties, the, the tie sections. Here's a little close up. Uh, what's really cool are these, I don't know if you can see, I'm pointing out these little pieces. These are jigs that uh, ITLA supplies, which you use to set the spacing of the girders, of the spanner girders, so they'll fit to the track. Um, Really cool. And Nick has, you know, thought of a lot of this stuff because not only does he manufacture them, he also builds them. So he's thought of a lot of neat things to help us. So here you can see this. This is some of the stacks of the girders that, that were used for the assembly. And here you can see these are the, uh, the ties assembly. They're about nine, what, nine inches long. Uh, and basically you just glue them down. Everything was done with weld bond throughout this whole model. Uh, and you can see the little spacer blocks that I used to set the distance from the edge of the trestle or, or of the trestle to the beginning of the, of the ties. And then once again, once I had everything to this point, I set it back up again on the layout to make sure that everything would clear. Uh, one of the things you could see is that there are some of the uh, trestles are three track wide trestles where I needed to clear over tracks. And then the rest of them are just two track trestles just to support the, the uh, subway. Then it was on to rail, rails and guards. Uh, Nick convinced me, gave me the courage to try hand laying track. Uh, honestly, this was the first time I ever did that. Uh, it's code 83 track. Uh, here you can see those rail joint, those uh, module joiners at the end. I actually had to mill out the ends of the ties so those uh, could fit on top of them and then be at the same level for the track. So that's uh, the A section, which is one of the long sections. Here's the curved section. Uh, so you can see how that went together. And the walkways. Um, the walkways that were furnished were five boards wide. Uh, I actually cut them down to four boards because uh, it was more to the prototype. But you can see some of the detail, uh, the bolt holes that are there, the holes on those little projections, those little tabs, those are for the handrails, which you'll see in a, a little bit. Uh, and here is gluing up those. Those were all pre-painted, same painting technique. Uh, I did a little more staining on those to show, you know, they were walkways. Uh, so here I'm gluing up the walkway on the curved section. 
And here's a little detail. And again, you can see the way that the finger joints where the walkways join to one another, the tabs that are there for the, uh, for the railings, just really superior, superior kit. Uh, those little clamps that I've talked about, here they are. Uh, 40 of them, you get 20 small ones and 20 large ones for eight bucks. Uh, and they are fantastic little clamps. Uh, just enough to hold things together, not too strong like I find some of the hard plastic ones from Harbor Freight are. So these have, I swear by these. I uh, actually found them from a, a guy who builds boats, model boats. He uses them all the time. So cross bracing and railing, that was next. So the cross braces underneath, there are cross braces for each track that you see here. And these are all made up of two components as well. There's a web and a flange that get glued together first and then painted. And then there's a uh, cross brace that goes from the spanner uh, girders to the trestle girders. And you can see those here. The railings are again, all cut. This is all just kind of, you know, cut them out from the sprue using a knife. And here you can see how they, they just fit perfectly into those tabs that are on the walkways. Next was the station. Um, so the station basically is just cantilevered out from one of the spanner, one of the modules uh, with those beam extensions, the main beam extensions and the bracing. Uh, my station was actually too wide. I had two modules because uh, I wanted to have two uh, cars stop. Uh, so here you can see I've now I've done the extensions and put the framing in. Uh, the kit comes with wooden girders to support to support the uh, station deck. I actually opted to use some styrene H beams uh, just because it was more prototypical. And here you can see here's the front view of the station and the rear view of the station and a little detail. Uh, added in some signs, found some period signs from some photographs and had them printed up. Uh, the station is Liberty Avenue, which is actually a stop on the A train in, in Brooklyn. Uh, the electrical boxes you see there, we'll get into later, a little bit later, that's part of the control system for the whole thing. And here's a, a good clear picture of the, of the station platform. And you had to get up to the station. So the stairs, this is a picture of the stock kit uh, from ITLA, uh, really well detailed. And again, just a breeze to cut out and uh, put together. One of the gr coolest things that Nick has done are these little jigs. Uh, this is a picture of the N scale one, but the HO scale one is similar. Uh, it makes assembling stairs so easy and so fast. And uh, Nick, I believe you sell the stair kits separately, right? Yeah, that's that's correct, Bob. And, and so their their scale and HO, they're six feet wide. Um, it's a double runner, so it's a closed-in stringer. Uh, so you have two pieces: one that's notched out for the treads, and then a solid piece on the outside. They're just beautiful stairs. So uh, I plan on using them for some other structures. So again the original, but then this was what I wanted to create. So uh, it was the difference between having a flat roof and a peak roof on the stairs. So what I did was I milled up some blocks uh, with both the interior angle, I scaled off the interior angle and the exterior angles of the stairway, and then cut some other blocks with the, it's a 15 degree, well, actually it's a 30 degree miter at the, on the roof peak. And uh, just made up different lengths for the, what I would need for the stairs. I first tried to do it uh, using the material that came with the kit, but they, because I was bending them, they were too narrow. So I actually wound up scratch building the whole thing. So this is st styrene uh, assembly. And here again, I'm using those little clamps and holding everything together while the glue dries. 
And here you can see what it looks like when it's painted. Uh, it really came out wonderfully uh, and pretty close to the prototype. And here you can see how it integrates into the station itself. Uh, eventually I'll paint that. I have to paint the roof of the station that same uh, kind of terracotta color. Here's another shot of the stairs. So the detail is just great. I mean, the railing detail, the treads being open. I mean, it's just, it's just beautiful. So final assembly, uh, basically just drilling some holes for some wiring, which we'll, I'll show you. Uh, so this is the A section, which is the five spans. Then I added in the subway. Again, just via the magnets, there's no mechanical connection between any of these modules. And then the curved section C, and then the end section. This is, uh, Nick has told me this is his favorite picture because you really get a sense of the length of the run. Uh, it's really pretty cool. This also, one of the um, serendipitous things that happened was the scale of the elevated really fits in perfectly with the scale of my background. Uh, it really looks like it's in that city, you know, in that place. So that was just lucky on my part. So finally, control. Uh, the first thing I did was try to build up a control unit, and it did work uh, using circuitron components, uh, reversing board and uh, sensing board, um, using latching and delay relays and optical sensors, which is what circuitron has couple of problems, inconsistent stop locations, too sensitive to lighting levels, because I plan on having this operate both as daylight and nighttime. And there was no speed ramping. So the, it would just go and stop. Uh, there was no real momentum. So lo and behold, new tracks modeling to the rescue and Iowa scale engineering, which I saw one night and uh, their motor man controller and uh, using their infrared sensors, there's ramped acceleration and deceleration, as well as a infinite speed adjustment, uh, ease of adding a station, consistent stop location, really, really uh, right on a dime, and the ability to custom program. You'll see that I have this set up so my uh, subway runs local in one direction and express in the other direction. And the motor man allows you to do that. Here's a shot of the uh, train spotter, the infrared proximity sensor. It's about two inches long overall and a quarter inch high. I originally was going to build it into like a signal tower, uh, but it just, the scale didn't work out. So what I did was I wound up using some uh, electrical boxes from Walther's and milled out the ends of the boxes so that the sensor would slide in from the end and the cables come out the bottom. And then you can see the actual sensor through that one hole that faces away from the viewer. So you never see that hole. And then the wiring is all run in conduit, <coughs> PVC conduit. Um, the sensor itself is mounted on a grating. And then I bent up these, uh, PVC tubes. I found that if you just shove a as tight as you can solid piece of electrical wire down through a straight tube, and then I just used a heat gun and a, uh, I built up a jig so that I would have a consistent radius. And that worked out real well. And here you can see how I kind of finished things off using some uh, channel with some little wire U bolts that hold everything in place. And this is a power setup. So you have both the, the red and the black to the plus and minus coming out. Underneath the layout, I built up these little, made up these little terminal blocks, which provide track power. And then the sensors themselves need power as well as the sense line. So there's left, the left end, the right end, and then C is the station, which is in the center. As far as the subway itself, it's an MTH uh, R22 set, which was uh, good for the period I'm modeling the late 50s. Um, 
Um, if anyone can help me out with modifying the sound files on these, I appreciate it. I did find something, but it's gonna it's it's a long learning curve to do that, but it's it's a pretty cool little set. So uh, I have a little bit uh, a little short video here, which uh, I'd like to play for you. I was told that it may jump a little bit, so uh, I apologize for that. So here you can see it's. And there's announcements for the stations. You see it stopped at the station when it runs uh, towards the, the south. And there's one of the sensors in the electrical boxes. And again, the way that it uh, the way that it fits into the background was a real pleasant surprise. And this direction, it's running express, so it doesn't stop at the station. I could change that if I wanted to. And there it is at the other end. That is beautiful modeling, Bob. Just absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Let me uh, stop the share here. So are there any questions that anybody has? Anything Nick and I, Nick is here as well. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Well, I've got one for Nick. Uh, Nick, what advice can you give people who might want to add an elevated subway or whatever you get you know, the elevated track uh, to their existing model railroad? I mean, do I have to tear it all up and start over? Or how can I integrate that? Because I, I was really impressed with what Bob has accomplished here. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I, I think, well, first of all, I want to say thanks to Bob. I mean, he did a fantastic job, um, obviously a very ingenious job in terms of all the, the little um, um, assembly fixturing that he, he employed. I mean, the, the, the thought process, Bob, is fantastic. I love it. Um, you can see some examples uh, here beside me in addition to what Bob showed you. And Jim, to answer your question, um, I'll hold up this this uh, section of elevated. This is um, a piece of the what I would call the Chicago elevated. Um, as Bob showed you, the construction, um, the laser cut wood construction here is very very simple. So what Bob did is exactly what I'd hoped many modelers would consider, standard gauge modelers like myself, to be quite honest. Um, you can build sections of of this elevated railway system and just fit it on top of your existing layout. You can modify, as Bob did, uh, using different length main beams to span wider track, uh, standard gauge track widths, as an example. Um, you can, you know, chain on additional um, sections. You can, you can cut and fit and curve those sections, uh, as Bob has shown us too. So yeah, you can add yourself a section of elevated railway and add that animation that Bob did. And he inspired me so much that I've ordered two of those motor masters as well. I think those are, are fantastic control systems. So I'm going to employ those on my own layout as well. Yeah. Rick, let me ask you something about that product. They call it what Bob was talking about, motor man? The motor man. Yeah, sorry, I, mis I mispronounced that. But yeah, um, so Iowa Scaled Engineering is the source. And can, you gonna... do me, can you do me a favor? Sure. Uh, uh, can you send me a, a contact and information about them? Because, you know, I, I think that that can apply easily to my trolley stuff and to traction layouts and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and the, reason, the reason I was asking about do I have to tear up and start over, I see a use for that on my existing traction layout. Because yeah. my traction layout is all downtown. Uh, part of it is, is all downtown. And to expand it, this this could be an easy thing for me to simply add, as long as I can kind of plop it on 
on top without having to destroy a lot of stuff on the way. I think you're you're right, and it's a great product. And I I'll uh, send you the link for sure. And what I'm going to also do is I'll put it up on my website. I've spoken to them already and and have that permission to do that. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to add it to my website so people can go and understand exactly what Bob has done. Is is a, a, what a great way to enjoy that that extra level of animation on your layout. That other you know another another um, uh, railway modeling opportunity that not too many people will would even consider, but, you know, hats off to Bob again for doing that. And um, it just adds so much to that city scene of his. I think it's fantastic. And, and Bob, if you would consider doing it, I'd love if I can get a hold of this company and, and be interested, I'd like to invite them to be on our show and really demonstrate not just the elevated uh, railroad uses of it, but how their motor man can, can help us all in different applications. Absolutely. But but if you could come back and, and and talk again about your use of it and how difficult it is, how easy it is, or the, the issues that you faced in, in using it, because this to me is a brand new technology. I've never heard of this before. Okay. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. And uh, just it was originally built for the museum industry, from what they've said, told me, um, for automated museum layouts for trains. And they just came out with a new module that you can actually connect the motor man into your regular DCC system so that you can switch from manual control with a throttle to automated control through the motor man. I'll if be you just want to have your layout operating by itself. Right. So. Rick, uh, Rick, let me ask you something. Was this new technology for you or did you know about this? I, I did not know. Uh, actually, Bob, in communication with Bob over the last year, he's he's the one that kind of turned me on to this, uh, this control yeah. system. So, yeah, I, I thank him for that because it's, it's excellent. What are you going to use it for? I'm going to do the same thing that Bob has done with a section of elevated. You know, as an example on my modules behind me here, uh, I envision a short section of elevated and my MTH train running back and forth just like Bob did. Right. And to, and to do this, what do you have to buy to, to, to do it? Let, let's say that you want to do something that's eight, 10 feet long. What, what do you have to buy to do that? Well, you can go uh, take a look at my website, itlascalemodels.com, and you'll see there's a couple of different versions of the elevated kits that we sell. And you'll basically just buy yourself the, um, the starter. We have a starter and extension kits that you can chain together to create whatever length of, uh, of run you wish. Uh, there's a couple gentlemen that I'm working with now that are actually creating closed loops as well. So uh, you can do point to point, you could do closed loops, uh, whatever, whatever you, you wish. So um, yeah, so just, as, just for a sense of demonstration, that's O scale. I don't produce this just yet, this is a prototype, but you can see that just for the size of it, um, in terms yeah. of adding, sections jim you yeah could create yourself um you know yeah absolutely yeah a nice display listen wait i don't know when you're going to come out with that product but if you'd like i'd love to write about it in my articles in oscale resource magazine when you finally come out with the oscale version okay okay I'll, I'll keep that in mind for sure i got a lot of guys starting to ask so i'm uh, considering even a special run in that scale yes. okay Anybody have any more questions for uh, either person, either Rick uh, Massey of ITLA or Bob Davidson, the modeler? Guys, I want to thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I learned an awful lot. Uh, Bob, I was so impressed when I first saw uh, what you were doing. That's why I wanted you on the show. I, well, I think you. this is really unusual and something different and, and something that, uh, you know, people that may consider their the railroad, you know, we don't have any more space and so forth. Well, go up a little bit and get some yeah. more skin. Yeah. Well, and again, this was just very prototypical with what, what I've always wanted to do on the layout. So it yeah. just worked out great. And, uh, I know Bob Farquhar still on. I know before he uh, was showing in the quick tip, I just thought I'd throw this in. This is a section of chain link fence made using hardware clock, just like he showed tonight. Yep. This will actually be all the fencing around the yards and everything on the layout. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Listen, you know, 
the, the kind of scratch building you did to make the, uh, the roof for your uh, walkway or your stair area, mm -hmm. that's the kind of scratch building that the people that I learned how to model with, that's what they used to do. They would build those kind of things, jigs or whatever you want to call it. And that was just part of scratch building to them. That was just part of model building. They didn't think about it. If they wanted a roof a certain way, then they'd build something like you just built and, and uh, they, they'd have what they wanted and they called it scratch building. Yeah, there you go. It was and so, so fun. I have to say it was so much fun. I bet it was. And, and I'll mention to you, you know, Chris Blackmark, uh, has his, the, uh, moderates the show for me on, on Saturdays. And I really think you and Chris ought to get together because your capability at scratch building is exactly what we hope the scratch building workshop would, would be and have different people demonstrate different scratch building techniques and, and, and you know, educate the average modeler. Because I, I tell you, a lot of modelers would have said, well, I don't, no one makes this kind of roof, so I can't have it. They never think about, I'll just build one. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Chris to get in touch with you. And okay. uh, maybe you all can get together and, and you can uh, start helping us uh, with the, uh, the Saturday show. Actually, if I could get Bob to go to the New Tracks website and on the uh, uh, workshop page there, uh, at the top is my email, and if you could drop me an email, that would uh, make it real easy for us to communicate. I will do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Or if you have trouble, just send me the email, and I'll, send, I'll forward it to, uh, to Chris. Either way, it's easy. But thank you so much, Bob, and thank you so much, Rick. I really do appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us tonight. You're very welcome. You're welcome, guys. Thanks a lot for listening. Well, that's basically our show. I've got a couple more comments. Uh, we have a, a good crowd here tonight, and, and I anticipate that we're going to have an awful lot of people view the video. Uh, I want to encourage uh, and, and beg you, really, uh, to go on our uh, YouTube channel, New Tracks Modeling, N-E-W-T-R-A-C-K-S Modeling, M-O-D-E-L-I-N-G, and subscribe to it. You need to ring the bell when you subscribe and you'll get notices of every one of our shows that we do. We have right now 800 and something uh, subscribers. Uh, and I want to get at least 1100 uh, by the end of May of this year. That is what I'm shooting for. That's my goal. And the only way that I'm going to get there is if you want to help get us there. So I'm begging you to please go and subscribe if you haven't. Or tell your friends to subscribe if they haven't, so that we can get the additional two or three hundred people we need in order to meet that goal. It's new tracks modeling, and just go and subscribe and ring the bell. Uh, the other advantage of when you do that, the you'll be able to see this video of this show time and time again because all of our shows are videoed and they're all on our channel. We got five hundred and fifty of them there right now. The other advantage that we do is we'll be breaking up the show. So instead of you having to go and necessarily watch the whole two hour show, if you don't want to, you'll be able to go and see just this picture, just this portion, or you'll be able to go and see Jim Murphy's portion. So you can pretty well pick and choose. So if you see something that you like, you want to tell your friends about it, you want to see it again, you don't have to do that because the, the various individual pieces are broken up already for you on our uh, uh, YouTube channel. So please, please, guys, uh, we're doing a lot of work here to try to give you the best possible shows that we can give you and, and try to introduce you to what at least I consider uh, to be really talented modelers and really fantastic manufacturers, some of which you may never have heard of before. Uh, that's one of the comments that I've received time and time again. Never heard of that manufacturer, just like this motor man tonight. You know, we find these things out because we try to get the best possible modelers and the best possible manufacturers we can to come on our show and to help us out. So please help us out this way, your way, by subscribing to our 
YouTube channel, New Tracks Modeling. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to do is start recognizing the new people that are subscribing to our channel. So I'm gonna read you the names that I've been given of the people in January and February that are new subscribers to our YouTube channel. And here they are. And welcome to them. Thank you so much for wanting to do it. Scale Industry. I don't know who that is, but thank you for coming. Andy Con Trains. Thank you. Proto Lancer. John Town and Maryville Model Railroad. Don't know what that is, but I'm going to try to look it up. CB Greenwald. Thank you. Blacksmith Johnny. I've got to meet Blacksmith Johnny. I love to talk to blacksmiths. Uh, Push Cart Pete. Love to talk to him or her. Then there's somebody by the name of Capital S, Capital S, Small A, Capital A, 2. Welcome, whoever you are. Gary Woodward, George Smith, Daniel Notley, Gene Turner, David Beal, Rail Yard Production, Reefman 21, Stuart Friedman. And I really appreciate all of you all signing up and wanting to participate uh, with our shows and uh, be involved with us on YouTube. Uh, you're part of what makes this work, show worthwhile doing. Uh, we've had around 60 something people, 65, I think, at one point, uh, watching the shows live tonight. Uh, we'll, I anticipate getting at least three to 400 more people watching the video of this show later. So, for the people that have put on the, uh, the presentations, the manufacturers that have participated and given their time, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what makes this all worthwhile. That's how we learn from each other. And I can't thank you enough for doing it. And with all of that said, I'm going to turn this over so we can start having some fun from Mr. Clark Cooney, MMR, for the after show. Welcome, Clark. Howdy, Jim. Well, you know, this, this whole uh, evening had a bit of a theme. First, it was undercover. And then it was all about the night. And then it was all about elevating the show. <laughs> all right. Whatever. 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 <laughs> hey, you have to work with the material that you got. Uh, I've, been, I've been doing that for two hours. <laughs> yeah, we know. Um, <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Uh, anyway, how is everybody tonight? I did see some brand new names. Now, if they haven't left, I am going to call on you. Uh, let's see. Where, where did all the names go here that were? Did they already leave? Oh, you guys are missing the best part of the whole show. Um, anybody here new that I don't see up here? Please unmute yourself and say, oh, Al Collins is new. Yes, he is new. <laughs> Al, oh, uh, uh, oh, and Ted is already uh, put in the chat, uh, like, what's for dinner? And he says, the answer is food. Okay. Uh, that's not very exciting, Ted. Uh, I just talked to uh paul thompson's wife and he's feeling much better and uh he appreciates all the uh all the uh comments and get well wishes so uh on behalf of paul uh thanks very much what happened to him yeah a little cool video oh yeah so yep bad or uh, well i'm it's you know that's a health question so i won't answer it Oh, okay. But he's feeling better. Good. Uh, and, oh, Mr. Al, I heard you had a big uh, wing ding at your shop today. Did I? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Who told you, Clark? <laughs> I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> uh, you read it. That's a health issue. <laughs> That's a health issue. <laughs> what? Could have been. <laughs> uh, hey, um, did... There was a fellow here from Kingston Model Works. Is he, is he still here? No, he's gone. Oh, that's too bad. 
because uh, I believe he has kind of a store out in Kingston. Is that is that correct, Mr. Farquhar? No. That's, oh, that's totally different. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. The one thing you think when you think of is uh, Kingston or the um, oh, now I can't remember the name of the store. <laughs> Jeez, he's running out of his house. It's uh, Kingston Kingston Locomotive Works. Yeah, well, that was him, wasn't but, it? No, his it has that E on the end of Kingston. It's Kingstone. Oh, 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 the oh. The other okay. one's Kingston. Oh, okay. You're That's tenor. what happened this afternoon with all the fumes we were breathing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Uh, for those, I, I, I hate inside jokes too much. So um, Mr. Uh, Collins was giving a uh, airbrush clinic today uh, with uh, a number of different paints i believe yeah <laughs> different people too <laughs> and, and airbrushes <laughs> and different airbrushes yeah. were you there larry yeah oh okay yeah, it was a good afternoon excellent uh all right who else have we got that we haven't talked to for a while uh nick you haven't been on for a while how are you nick Hey, Clark. Yeah, doing pretty good. Can't complain. Good. Yeah. It was good to come back on. It's been a while. Yeah. And uh, I see our uh, other friend, Brian, is here. So, hi, Brian. He's probably watching the Blue Jay game or something. I don't know. Yeah. And don't I don't want to know the score. Anybody. I'm taping the games. <laughs> You're talking about Brian Schilling? He's, he's on, I guess. I know. Here. He's there. Well, there he is. Okay. Yeah, I'm working, you... on, I'm working on something here. Are you? Yeah. Okay. And uh, what else is going on? Let's see. Uh, Mr. Shergold, Jeff. Jeez, uh, where did all the new guys go? That would have been interesting to talk to. You scared oh, them away. I was going to say, well, hey, your, rep your reputation uh, precedes you. Yes. Um. Well, well, especially especially when you said, hey, I'm going to call on you. And all of a sudden, a lot of them disappeared. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Went from 42 to 21. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. Oh, well. The hard, the hard uh, core is here, I guess. So, but. I uh, haven't caught that in a long time. <laughs> I, I sooner hardcore than hard up. <laughs> oh, boy. Why did I even? Oh well. <laughs> sometimes you sometimes you lob them up there and you can hit a home run. <laughs> Hair's too short now to be called hardcore. <laughs> uh, boy. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Um, Nick, are you working on anything new? Yeah, I got a I got a few things, few irons in the fire. Um, um, couple you of. You don't have Sorry? to give out any secrets, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I got a I got a structure kit in in HO that's coming along a little slower than I hoped. It's an industrial uh, kind of a configurable kit. You know, our theme is configurable structures, so right. it's actually hiding. I'll tell you what, I won't give it anything away. It's somewhere back here. <laughs> <laughs> someday, someday, someday it'll come out. So we, got all, we got that going on. Um, we got a little work going on in the background with uh, with our friend Brian. He's, uh, he's <laughs> helping. Uh, we're co we're collaborating on some stuff. I could say uh -oh. that, right, Brian? That's and, right. Uh, what else? Uh, got a couple things in N scale going. Got some HO going. This uh, this thing here I brought out just for fun in that elevated discussion, but uh, I've had this kicking around for a long time as a prototype, but look at the size of that piece of elevated monster. And the challenge is, would anybody ever buy that? You know, as a manufacturer, could you, could you really make that a profitable product? I'm not 100% sure yet, just because of the sheer size. And just... Uh... Because you and I were talking in the chat about it, but uh, that is O scale. That is O scale, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's probably I don't know how much MDF and and micro plywood is in this thing, but it's it's a monster. Yeah. Uh, but you know it, it's a large, obviously a large section, but you know that could that probably would go closer to about a hundred bucks, I would guess, retail, which is yeah. 
probably out of everybody's reach. So well, man, cool. is there well, enough? Man, the old hey, cliche, right. you make yeah. it, they'll come. <laughs> was there enough guys in O scale doing something big enough to justify the the elevated? That's kind of the question. It's a good question, but actually, I think there actually are. There's, you know, there's there's a whole another group of guys out there modeling the subway systems and the elevated systems hmm. of New York, Chicago, and some of the Boston stuff. I understand, and you know, honestly, we saw a bunch of the stuff you would never have guessed it. I would never, as normal as a normal as a model railroader, you know, your standard stuff. I would never have assumed that, this, that there was enough people in that part of the market. Uh, there's, a, there's a ton of interest out there, N scale, HO scale, and um, in O scale as well. So, well, I could, see, I could see some of the O scale clubs really jumping on that bandwagon to, uh, to oh, add maybe. to their stuff, yeah. I, I yeah. see more than that. Uh, I'm on with a different group of fellows. I'm in O scale myself. So I pay attention to what O-Scalers are doing. But on uh, Facebook, there's O-Scale uh, shelf layouts. Yep. And most times, you, like Clark is going to do a little uh, layout in O-Scale down in Nevada, <laughs> Arizona, sorry. But uh, so most times they pick something they want switching. A lot of times that's just what's all behind you there, sort of an industrial area. Yep. This very well could be running. They could plop this overhead and you haven't got a big footprint. It's not them. Most of them they're saying 12 feet long, 10 feet long, but switching layouts two feet deep or, or 30 inches possibly. But this gives you, you're, you're elevating, you're going vertical rather than horizontal. And right. there's another interest in what they're building now. It could be underneath. It could be all this, the switching layouts down underneath uh, with industries behind. Yeah. True too. Just yeah. a thought it came, but, but there's uh... no. I like it. Good idea. And and you know, there's also a uh, in, in New York there was something called the High Line, if yes. anybody knows what that is. And that's that's another item that could be modeled, I think, because it, it's it's allowing you to run standard uh, railway on top of an elevated structure like this that's been beefed up to support. You know, in in that that's day right. it was supporting full size New York Central equipment. And that would, the high line's been longer. switched into like a park kind of elevated yeah. park now, like right. and just some of the stuff that's still there is just, exactly. it'd be an incredible modeling opportunity for sure. Yeah. And yeah. it would be great for modelers because what it used to go right through buildings. Yeah. Exactly. There's yeah. some amazing two, two, stuff. Three there. stories off the ground and it was going through the buildings. Yeah. We yeah. do that to hide at either end of the track, maybe a little yard or something. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, you guys are inspiring me. I like it. <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh, I, you know, I think you have to get a feel for it, but uh, you just might be surprised at uh, at the demand out there for it. Yeah, that's worth uh, it's worth probing it a little further. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, it's like a flat surface in your home. You're going to put a model or trains on it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> at least that, that's what my wife keeps telling me about the basement yeah for sure. i can't have a flat surface down here but anyway <laughs> i can't even find one anymore yeah me neither so and she told me the washer dryer was strictly off limits <laughs> that's, that's my last frontier when i start building these modules but they'll have to come down to every two days so you can do a wash <laughs> So, but, uh, interesting. Um, all right. Anybody else have anything that they just want to chime in and talk? Uh, Ted, what are you working on? Are you you're having dinner? Maybe uh, I don't know. Gary, what are you working on, uh, Mister Shergold? Are you uh, doing anything right now? I just Got finished a Sylvan stone structure. Oh, it's a, it, it, it's a model. He uh, produced from his, uh, I'm assuming, relatives. And when I built it, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful model. Um, but the back area of it is very plain. So what I did was I took a, uh, I built a summer kitchen on the back oh. with, a, with a deck 
and um, just to give it some a little more dimension. And what I'm going to do is take some photographs of it, send it into uh, my builds. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, just to show what, uh, you know, like take an ordinary structure and add something to it and just turn it into something else. Yeah. I, well, I was really, well, what I had done is uh, I, I took uh, some of Chris's uh, methods of uh, the pastels and that when I did the brickwork or the, uh, the coloring of the stone. And um, I started off with three different layers, a base layer, a colored layer on the stone, and then uh, a wash over it. Hmm. And I, I was quite amazed uh, after doing the chalk and the washes uh, of the, uh, it, it actually took the brightness of the structure itself and dulled it right down. And I thought it turned out to a perfect uh, stone color. Neat. Neat. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, I don't know if you've got a little sample of that. Maybe you could do a little clinic on that one, Mike. Yeah, well, I, I, I got the idea from Chris. Like, yeah. I've been going crazy on these pastels. Yeah. And they're, they're uh, working out like I'm extremely pleased with them. Yeah. And, and uh, another, another good thing I do is uh, I'm really happy with the hunter line stains. Yeah. You can do so much with them, like combining the pastels and the stains. Yeah. It's just amazing. Checks in the mail, Gary. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am. Uh, Rick is, uh, uh, as I say, um, Pat Rivard got me started with the stains. And I was at one of your clinics uh, one time. Yep. And uh, I happened to get a, uh, a bottle and I've been playing around with it. And like, I can take a yellow, uh, uh, take a plastic structure, paint the structure yellow. And by taking your red stain, I can stain it and it comes out a beautiful brick color. Good. That just takes the yellow completely away and adds a nice uh, multi-tone red brick. And what I've done with it, uh, I've taken plastic models. If you like that, I, I build a lot of DPM and a lot of NYX products too. Like not a lot of NYX products, but I have a few. And uh, I find that uh, using the, uh, if you got a section of uh, uh, brickwork that is supposed to stand out on a model by taking if you paint the model yellow or, or, a, or a lighter color, and then you use the red stain, it actually highlights and changes the brick color so that that uh, section that's supposed to be highlighted actually sticks out. It's mm. quite nice. Neat. Really one nice. Of neat, one of the neat effects we um, go through is we uh, have the, the five earth tones, uh, the yellow okra, the burnt almond, the burnt sienna, the raw sienna and raw umber. Did I say them all? I think so. That makes a, a great combination of what you were just saying. Start with the yellow and start adding the other colors on top of it. It, it makes a, a really good effect. Yeah. I take, uh, I take the tops off of uh, peanut butter jars. Uh, that seal that's on there. Yeah. And what I do is I take uh, I take that and I form them over different objects and make like a canvas. I paint the and then once once it's done I cut it out, paint the uh, canvas or the aluminum uh, top cover a uh, it's like a beigey brown color, and then I take your stains and start staining it to weather it. And it's, they get some very interesting uh, uh, patterns on weathered uh, canvas. That's cool. That's cool. Quite nice. Quite nice. It works. It works great on uh, if you put a bottle in your blue jeans. 
if you put it in your pocket and then the cap falls off. <laughs> it's, it's great. What do you got that's a tattoo? We, you got a tattoo for life or what? <laughs> well, basically, but that's when one leg's a different color than the other leg. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a, a true story. <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to hear what your doctor says when you go for the appointment after that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I don't know if we have medication for this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have to tell you the story. You know, our bandwidth here is so bad, and, yeah. and so on. I know I've complained about it a whole bunch, but this week's segment. I started it on Good Friday morning, and it, it was going to be 31 or 32 hours to upload. So it got into about 29 and a half hours into it, and the system aborted it. And, and I thought, because we dedicate a Wi-Fi just for that. So about 29 hours into it, the, the whole system aborted the upload. So, oh boy. So then all day Saturday and most of Sunday, we uploaded the next version, like the, the next uh, version four again. And uh, this one, I guess, went through. I don't know how it's coming out on your screens, but on mine, it's still bad because our, of our Wi-Fi. <laughs> but so that means I'm, I spent over 60 hours of Wi-Fi time over the weekend trying to get that segment to the new tracks uh, storage thing. <laughs> Actually, I thought it, went, it was well, it went well tonight, The your segment. So it seemed to oh, good. not be, it yeah. didn't seem to be too, as jumpy as, as sometimes when you do it, your live uh, portion. And that, and that's just yeah. your bandwidth. And that's why. Just, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why we're doing it this way because it comes out clearer. Yeah, yeah. Like it makes me tired about these guys who have 500 MBPs and and now there's up to a thousand MPPs and we're at 4.21. <laughs> so, and you actually mean like 4.21. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. That's funny. Well, Ken, as I Ken did a, a, a as Ken, I said, Ken did a speed control thing on our system. Yeah, <laughs> and it was brutal. Four, that's that's how we found out it was four point two one. Uh, all right, hey, uh, Daryl, Daryl J out in beautiful British Columbia. What's happening out in the uh, West Coast there? And don't tell me warm and sunny. Oh, I think he just left. Sure. We talk to no. him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if I did that years ago, where I'd be right uh, now. <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, that's why they have you, Clark, at the end of the show. That's right. Uh oh. Uh oh. There he is. Uh oh. So I actually plugged the microphone in. Oh. What's happening I got, out I got the, the screen West? I got the screen off because I'm eating dinner and nobody needs to see that. So oh, okay. What's uh well what's for dinner? Oh we're having uh made some I made some Asian fried rice today, so leftovers nice. from nice. All right. Joanna doesn't cook, she can't boil water, so <laughs> oh she can burn water. <laughs> burn water and water. Oh that's what we need to start a domestic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy we, we i have a friend uh uh unfortunately she just recently passed away but she used to say that i can't cook water so but uh anyway um all right who else is uh out there that we haven't you know daryl your cat's kind of scary the way it <laughs> scares at me <laughs> you should see him in real life <laughs> <laughs> I think that look is really old scale. <laughs> you know what? I saw a great bumper sticker the other day. It said dogs have masters, cats have staff. Yeah. <laughs> I 
think that's true. I I thought the best uh, one of the best um, things I've been saw lately was on uh, I think it was on Facebook or whatever, and they it was uh, here. I'll show it to you. I thought this was just classic of the world today. Um, <laughs> if it's in stock, we have it. So I that'd that be was, good to put on a model. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really a good. Uh, you know, they just got to find it. Yeah. Um, a good one I saw. Well, actually, I read this in a uh, in a novel, but the sign on a tattoo parlor said, "Tattoos while you wait." <laughs> uh, well, you know there's some some really good play on words uh on some buildings i mean of course there's the old one you know salmonella's restaurant and blah 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 but um there's there are some good ones that uh people have come up with and i think it was uh oh what was the gentleman's name uh east coast guy who had, uh, you know, uh, miracle chair company? If it's, if you're sitting on our chair or something, it's a miracle. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that that's uh, that's an old joke. In fact, I used it on. I have this little boathouse uh, gag that I uh, I put together in the sign, and it says a miracle boat company. If it floats, it's a miracle. Yeah, yeah. And so back to the we, dog we and cat a, thing, the back to the dog and cat thing, a dog thinks you are God. The cat thinks it is God. <laughs> That's true. When I lived in Owen Sound, there was a trucking company there called Fluke. Oh, yeah. The trucks were, <laughs> if it gets there, it's a it's fluke. A, it's, it's a fluke. A, yeah. it's a fluke. I remember that one. Yeah. Well, I still think that one of the best things things anywhere was the Moldex Toilet Seat Company of Buffalo, New York. Born born in Buffalo, raised everywhere. <laughs> what do you mean bad? It's excellent. It's bad. Uh, <laughs> that's the uh, there's this there's this one supply place which has uh, the owners have a unfortunate last name of Grimm, so it's called Grimm Building Materials. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, li living around the Seattle area and Puget Sound, um, there's a company in Seattle called Sound Investments. Hmm. Yeah, sure, sure they are. <laughs> sure they are. Yeah. So anyway, well, I'm I'm back in oh. on board now because I'm done running trains. I've been uh, playing with my new new toy. I finally oh. broke down and spent the money and went wireless, and I love it. <laughs> yeah. Now and now you want to get all that stuff off the top of your way out and have a have a real run well what i'm doing is i'm moving cars and stuff off the top of the layout because this peninsula that's behind where my monitor is right in a couple of weeks or so i'm going to start tearing it down and i'm uh, rebuilding doing something huh? completely different yeah. right. there's stuff behind me and around on that side is, is staying but um yeah, it's a couple of major decisions going on. Good. Good. And I'm preparing for, a, for in two years, a first in-person not a railroad event coming up in a week and a half. And it's a, a small local swap meet. And um, I'm offloading a lot of stuff that I, if I really use common sense, I realize I don't need it. <laughs> I got to stop being a typical model railroader and I unload some of the accumulation that I'm never going to use. I think that... listening to this, Larry, <laughs> you got to start buying then. 
Right. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've resigned myself that there's some of this stuff I'm going to sell. And when I get going on, on building structures and stuff for the, for the modified layout, I may end up buying some of the same stuff. Maybe not the same one back from someone else, but the identical. identical Larry used to do that. He trade stuff else. in it. Larry used to trade stuff in at Ray's and then buy it back before he left the store. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't do that with somebody else, but uh, I, br- I remember bringing a kit in from the States, importing it, and I never did get it built, and I took it to the to Ray's and traded it. Then I went to a, we used to have a thing called the Boomer's Auction in the fall up north. Yeah. And when I went up there and didn't the, that kit come up. So it was not going for near what the kit was worth. So I bought it again. So when I got it down to, they brought it down to my seat and I gave them the money. I opened it and was examining it. Didn't I find the papers I had accidentally left in there when I imported it? So <laughs> that's, that's actually kind of a cool story. Yeah, and I took it back to raise and trade it again. You know what I mean? <laughs> I made money on that one. I got just circulating it. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, hey, when, uh, Larry, when Larry like, walked in, Bree used to say, "Okay, everybody, pay attention. Larry's here." <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do? We're going to cut off the live feed and uh, the after show. We are going to continue on after, uh, so don't be, uh, don't leave. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank everybody for tonight's show that was cool. on, all the guys who gave the clinics. It was a super show. And uh, for all those who have just been participating in a little bit of the after show, we thank you. And uh, we'll cut it off uh, um, for tonight as far as uh, sort of the recording. But again, uh, check out new tracks and uh, hope you uh, ring the bell, as Jim says. Yeah, I think I'm going to go too. I just dropped in to say hi. So, hi. Good night. I was going to go too, but since Al's leaving, I'll stay. (laughs) <laughs> I'll get you. Uh, as soon as I can figure out how to stop the streaming, I'll be good. Uh, sorry, I missed you. We've been planting trees out here, so good. <laughs>